Yeah. I don't have any jacket at all, though. I oh, mean, really? Well, I mean, we park like 100 yards from the door. So you park in the visitors. I do 100 park. yards. I, I park like 300 <laughs> yards away. All right. I'm supposed to. <laughs> You're right. Oh, geez. Okay. He parks a little farther away and he needs a jacket. whoop a dee doo whoop a dee doo What's up? How you doing, man? Pauly Burmeister, Chris well. Sims. Chris Sims on Button Podcast presented by Verizon. Yes, I got to make is. sure I hit still that. I'm, I'm still not used to that. So, uh, but you doing good, man? Doing well. You know, the, listen to that. The jacket, the walk-in, parking a ways away. Big time snow coming out here. In Big time. It, any moment. My car is the only one not parked underneath something in the parking lot. Like, I apparently got here too late. So it's, it's all right. It, we're going to be out of here before the snow hits. If the blizzard begins while we're doing this, I, I'm in trouble. All right. You'll be okay. Don't worry. If it gets to that, I'll help you, you know, take the snow off the windshield or something. I'll and, do and, something. And can I wear your coat? Uh, I don't have a coat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, no, I cannot help you there. We got a good one today, right? What's up, everybody out there? What up, homies, broskies, whatever you want to call yourself? Uh, it's What the F*** Happened podcast. Big Phil's calling in today. I've heard that. We will be yeah. graced with his presence today. He's not going to be off having a life. So uh, <laughs> that's great. And we're going to have some good conversations. We're going to break down Browns, Ravens. That's, uh, that's going to be interesting. Uh, Chiefs, Dolphins. We're going to hit the Giants offense versus Arizona Cardinals. E. Right? Yeah, E is right. And I'm missing one. Oh, uh, who am I missing there? You're I'm missing, missing another one. What's that? Oh, the Buccaneers, the Buccaneers and Tom Brady and the Bucks offense, which was very cool, too. Mm-hmm. And I got some interesting little tidbits to talk about there. So that's going to be the show for the most part. And then, of course, we will end it with quarterback trivia. Tight ends, I heard. is the It's a, it's a tight end-based quarterback jeopardy. Okay. Uh, based off of Travis Kelsey's success this season. Right. And Pete chiming in with a suggestion about tight ends. So. Cool. I like it. Yeah. All right. I I'm already, like I got lot. the brain working already. And I know there is some QB quarterback correlation through the years, or QB tight end correlation throughout the years. Right. Uh, so that'll be cool. We'll end that, we'll, we'll end that, uh, end the podcast with that conversation. But go ahead, Polly. where do you want to start this thing? Well, first of all, I'm very excited this weekend to, to, to watch in person Trevor Lawrence, Notre Dame, Clemson. What? Get a little head start it's... on some things we'll probably be talking about in February. Why is that game? at four o'clock is, is that bad time for you yes what there's you nfl football on saturday this week that's right yes on saturday so that is pissing me off yeah and it's like i don't know why it's not on in prime time i don't understand that either and yeah. you know not added to that like it's not like it's two matchups that damn i want to see in, in the nfl it's my boy blue in buffalo on the early game and yeah. then it's Oh, Aaron Rodgers yeah. in the late game. So yes. I'm going to have my work cut out for me, changing channels and trying to figure out what to watch. Will you do the DVR and watch it late or just like get to it in the springtime? Well, about I know Lawrence. I'm going to get it to it in the springtime. That's why I'm never too like, oh, I got to watch this college game because yeah. I know when it comes draft time, I'm going to watch this game again anyways. You'll eventually uh, see it. But no, I'm, NFL gets priority in my life right now. Okay. So, I, I'm Understood. just going to be turning back every now and then to figure out what's going on. I will send you pictures. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Do that. Hopefully, Do that. hopefully from a booth with which or from which we can see. Right, right. Which would be ideal. That would be ideal. Okay, awesome game yep. on, on Monday night. Cleveland and Baltimore. Not only for the, the, the significance of the playoffs, but just the way that whole thing played out with the excitement and the late game lead changes and the, the unpredictable script for Lamar Jackson. So... Before we get into the specifics, yeah. your, your number one, couple days later, lasting impression of watching that game. Well, it, it definitely was one of the most exciting games of the year. There's no, there's no doubt about that. You know, I've heard a lot of people talk about, oh, it's the best game we've seen in the NFL since Rams Chiefs, you know, a few years ago. I, first off, I didn't like that game. I wouldn't even pick that to be the game of the year that year. There really? was no defense. Yeah. I don't like that. All right? You know, it, there were so many plays in that game where – the guy catches the ball, and nobody else is in the screen. I, that, to me, is not fun to watch. This, though high scoring, was a different style of high scoring. You know, it was individual players making unbelievable plays at time. It still was a physicality and defensive element to the football game. So I actually enjoyed this more than that Mahomes golf shootout from a few years ago. But I think... You know, what makes it or puts it into another level is just, of course, what happens at the end of the football game. Yeah, right. I mean, with Lamar Jackson coming in like that, I mean, I got friends texting me because I know they're gambling on the game. 
yeah. they're like, what the hell? And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, you must have took the Browns, huh? Way, huh? Why are you so worried that Lamar is back now? Can he do that? Why can he just come back? Because he's ready to come back. I don't know what else to tell you. You know, and the other question I get constantly with this is, you know, first off, it was a really long delay between when he came out of the game and when he came back. Yeah. I, I've I'm been on a lot of teams. You're right. I've been on a lot of teams with guys that need IVs. So this tells you this was more than your norm, normal dehydration. Yeah. And the fact that I, we've heard stories that, you know, he was still trying to, you know, move around a little and get fluid in him right before McSorley got hurt. You know, th that means it was like, that to me makes me think he had COVID-19. He says he mm -hmm. wasn't totally 100%, maybe not totally in 100%, you know, uh, stamina and in shape because of that little break of COVID and all that. But I've never seen that long of a break for an IV. And I also sit there and just go, does he get back in the game? Do they win if McSorley, if McSorley limps off the field in a hurry? Yeah. What happens? He's right. not going to get out there in time for fourth down. I know. So that, that, to me, is the other amazing aspect of this, that you know, McSorley lays there. That gives Lamar enough time to, whoa, let me get out there and then do that, you know, kind of lucky or whatever you want to say right. that way. But either way, it was amazing to watch. A lot of fun. And the fact that it was an hour between the fact that he came out there or he hadn't played in that long. Yeah. I was wondering, what does Greg Roman think, an offensive coordinator? Because it wasn't a, a play that got executed the way it was drawn up. And so he just comes out after an hour and just runs around and makes that happen. Right. How about the strength and conditioning, Coach? What are you thinking for all your warm-ups? And you have to be ready to play and uh, before you get out there. So no warm-up, just ran out there. No warm-up. And, and made a broken play happen. Well, yes. And we're going to break down that play in a minute. So right. I don't want to get too into the specifics there. But first off, like Lamar Jackson is in the Michael Vick category, all yeah. right? They don't really need to warm up. Like when we used <laughs> to play the Atlanta Falcons – and we'd be sitting there stretching on the field, and you look over across the field at, at the Atlanta Falcons, their whole team would be stretching. Mike Vick would just be standing there. Like, are we done yet? Because I've been ready since birth, and I'm ready to run. So are we good? You know, so I, you know, he's one of those guys that doesn't need to. But I just want to say this. It's those type of guys, though, that need IVs. And he ran a lot in the first half. And even on a cold night, you can cramp up. And if you're not hydrated or totally in tip-top 100% shape, you can cramp up as well. But, yes, in my history, it was always the freakiest guy on the football team that needed an IV. Right. You know, Joey Galloway, IV every game at halftime, his whole life. Hmm. You know, it, Brandon Marshall, IV every game. Because they're all muscle, they have no body fat, and they can burn that little percentage of body fat they have off in one football game and to where they need something for their muscles to be hydrated. We're eventually going to get to the Ravens yeah. uh, and, and offense and what, right. what Lamar did so well, uh, right. so explosive. Uh, couldn't be contained. Brown's offense, though, scoring 42 points yeah. in losing. A lot of positive about that. Baker Mayfield. Right. What would you think of what he was doing with that attack? Well, I, I, Baker Mayfield's, I, my, you could argue this might be the best game of his career. I think when you just take all into account, right, in a lot of ways, you know, answering the bell uh, a number of times in the football game, oh, down 14-7, doesn't look good. You guys need to make a drive here because it looks like Omar and everybody are going, well. oh, they answer the bell. Oh, he throws the pick six. Oh, man, they're done. This is over. Answer the bell, answer the bell. Yeah. So I think from that standpoint, it was really encouraging. The way he's throwing the ball right now is encouraging. This is a few weeks in a row where the ball is coming out of his hand perfectly. You can see just from the statistics here in the last two football games, you know, he's seen the field clearly, so there's no indecisiveness in his decisions. And even the quality of the football tells me he's throwing it well. Because every ball, I'm, I'm the kind of guy that watches coaches film and slow down plays so I can sit there and look at the ball. Is it spinning hard? Is it a perfect spiral? Is it a wobbler? You know, the ball is coming off his hand really, really clean well, right? right now. Yeah. So I think with that, he has a great understanding of the offense, how they want to play and doing that. And then the other aspect of that is Kevin Stefanski is doing a phenomenal job right now of keeping defenses off balance. You just don't know what to expect. Even though we know they want to run the football, you don't know when or what down or what personnel set they're going to run the football and when that's exactly going to happen. And I think that's the thing that I really like about their offense right now. It starts with their O-line. We know that. But Stefanski... Uh, keeping you off kilter with when he's going to run it. You know, you, it, just because he gets no yards on first down doesn't mean he might not run it on second down, you know. 
or you know, he, he, he might come out and run, run set and then pass it. But that, to me, is the thing that's really given them a great advantage right now in their overall offense. We sat right here last yeah. week and talked about how well they, they came out in heavy sets and ran against their own tendencies. Right. Ran on first down quite I'm, – I'm sorry, passed on first down yes. quite a bit. Did you see the same kind of tendency-breaking play calling – on Monday night. I did. You know, and let, let's just talk like the first drive of the game. That uh, kind of one that jumps off to me right away. He throws two screens, one on first down, uh, one on second down, the other on third down. Then he follows it up with a trick play with Jarvis Landry, right? right? And he throw, you know, throws the ball. So, you got that. You know, that's how you do excite your team and get everything going and man, I start attacking a defense and start to make them think like, oh, wow, like they got a little bit of everything here. So that's great. But here, I'll take you to another spot in the game that really jumped out to me to where I just went, wow, Stefanski is, he's feeling it right now. He's, it, it's 28 to 14. It's the biggest, one of the biggest drives of the game, right? And what I wrote, Stefanski doing a great job of being unpredictable. You know, they have a, uh, they and I'm gonna, let me just pull this up so I can get this totally right here, just because I got it. I got it all written down here, but I got a lot of notes in between. But when they get the ball in the third down, so the first first play, uh, the first play. Let's see, they got a first and ten incomplete pass. They get a first down, first and second down. Okay, they do that. Then they come back with a first down. Okay, incomplete pass. Now it's second and ten, and you go, oh, second and ten. They might have to throw it here or whatever. Mm-hmm. He runs it up the middle with Nick Chubb and they get 11 yards for a first down, okay? So that's a one example. Now, the next time around, it's first and 10. Incomplete pass again, kind of keeping you off balance because you don't know what to expect. Hey, we think they're gonna run on first down. Second down, okay? Second down, he gets into an empty set, still with a lot of run formation people and throws the ball. So now, if you're Baltimore, it just to me is like, you, you don't know really what to expect on certain downs or anything like that. Okay, so he does that on second down. They get nine yards, and you know what they do on third and one? You know, a little later in the drive, the third and one, the big play to Kareem Hunt, you know, again, running people on the field, it's third and one, and you're thinking, wait, they're going to probably run the football. They line up in the shotgun, okay, and now they motion him out. All right, so Baltimore, this is just, again, another example of this. Baltimore motion out. They're going to throw the ball, and they're going to throw it quick because they're blitzing. So they got to get it out quick. They got to get it out quick. What does he do? He keeps a tight end and Jarvis Landry in to block. So now he forms a seven man protection. Baltimore's all out blitzing because the back's out of the backfield and they're going, this got to come out quick. So let's force the issue. No, it doesn't. We got seven man protecting. Oh, and your linebacker went out there and covered Kareem Hunt? We'll oh, take that. and you think we're going to throw it quick? Let's run a double move off the quick throw. So Kareem Hunt runs a little five yard out and is really patient and sells it. Linebacker runs up a little to attack it. He turns up the sideline. Baker Mayfield, perfect strike. That's the example I'm talking about, keeping the defense off kilter, not knowing what to expect. I know I blabbered a lot there, but I hopefully I made my point eventually. I don't think any of it's blabbering. Right. It made me think that Andy Reid is also somebody as a play caller not afraid to leave extra guys in and have just a couple guys out to make sure that there's time for your quarterback. Definitely. You know, you can't get – I've talked about this with Pittsburgh. You know, that they've become predictable within their predictability right now. Oh, yeah, we're in the shotgun. We know you're going to throw it. And now you become even more predictable with you're going to throw it every play, and we know where you're going to throw it. It's going to be five yards or less. You know, so you have to be able to give teams something else to think about or they're going to come up with formulas and schemes to go, wait, when they get in this formation, it's kind of always thrown here and it's a quick throw so we can devise all these defenses. Now the next team that plays Cleveland, they're going to go, whoa, we got to reevaluate when they go empty. They can do a few different things that we didn't expect and it might make them be more vanilla or basic because you're scared of what they might throw at you. Baker Mayfield, last seven games, the team is 5-2. and two. 13 touchdowns, only two picks. Yeah. Back-to-back 300-yard games for the first time. Uh, all the things I can read about him, my favorite one, the last three games, Chris, yeah. only Mahomes has more passing yards. Yeah. So, I, like, you think about Cleveland, run first, run first, run first. Right. But the passing game has been terrific. Well, you know, and we see, like, just because you're a run first, run first, run first, you can be an explosive passing team, right? We've seen that. We, the Tennessee Titans are proving that to us. They're one of those teams that's kind of like that, right? Yeah. Run first, run first. But you and I always giggle because every time Tannehill drops back to pass, it's a 30-yard completion. Right. right? Like, whoa, the Browns are kind of getting there. 
And, you know, the other aspect that I think is really important here, and where I was a little negative on Stefanski was his drop back pass game. The fact that they have Chad O'Shea there from New England, just to infuse a few ideas and concepts that I see in their drop back pass game, it's the perfect combination. So they really have it down to how they want to play. And because of their offensive line and their two running backs are so elite, that gives them their greatest advantage. Baltimore's defense, let's hit on that real quick. Mm. The greatest thing about Baltimore is they're exotic. I don't know who's blitzing, what they're doing, what's going on. Baltimore couldn't have been more simple in this game. For Baltimore, they did nothing. Why? Because they were shit scared of that run game. And they said, we're not going to be crazy and getting all these sets and have you know two linebackers over here in this gap and a corner over here on this gap. And then all of a sudden they run the ball, some power formation at our two linebackers or a DB who we're trying to, and we can't hold up. So that made them very simple from that aspect. Also, listen, Baltimore's, they're, they're not playing good defense right now. They're a little banged up. Nobody on their defensive line pops other than Yannick Ngakwe at this moment. And these are tough matchups for them because right now they're not playing. We're seeing everybody run the ball in Baltimore. Right. Think about lately. The Patriots ran on them. Tennessee ran it on them. You know, we see this game. They're capable of running. They were so worried about stopping the run. That is what led to Baker Mayfield having just some optimal looks in the pass game to yes. just tear them apart that way. And just so many open looks to the to the sideline with, with nobody underneath those five to ten yard stop routes. Like that last drive they had where they went right down the field, just so easy, kind of unimpeded. Unimpeded, yes. And they they want to play. And I just there's a little inkling, and I want us to look at some stats from their their defense. But you know. The, uh, the one thing that I know with the run game and why that was the concern, the game got to 34-20. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, all the exotic stuff came because it's, they got to pass every play. So here we go. You know, we could, now, they're a little banged up in the secondary, and I think that also hurts them from being crazy exotic because they don't love their matchups across the board. I mean, as you saw, anybody who watched that game, as the game went on, Man, Cleveland just attacked, you know, Devontae uh, Devon, uh, Harris, the other, uh, the, the other DB on the other side there. Hold on, I'm going to come up with his name here for a second. Devontae Harris, yes, number 33. Um, they attacked him. So there's issues there. But it was that run game that simplified the Ravens in so many ways. And that really led to Baker Mayfield and their, their passing attack kicking some butt. We have a graphic on, on the Ravens' defensive ranks. You talked about it these last five games, how they've been struggling. Let's take a peek at that. And points allowed a game, 20 seconds out of 32 teams, 26 points. These are numbers that we just don't associate with the Ravens. Never. When we think about their defense. I know they're banged up. I know. But this is the group they have right now. Uh, how big of a liability is it for them right now in mid-December? Well, it, it's a big liability because I don't know if you can always depend on their offense to go out there and score 47 points or 45 points or whatever right. that is. They're, they're not that type of offense. Now, they played a defense, and we're going to break that down in a minute, that matches up very well with the Baltimore <laughs> offense as far as Baltimore can have success against it. But with the style, they got to improve. I mean – just to peel back the curtains, this is how my life works. I watch the game and I just go, man, Baltimore's defense. I feel like I've been saying this a lot the last few weeks. I text Pete Dimolitolitis. Mm-hmm. Pete, what? Because I'm thinking, what are Baltimore's stats the last five games? They got to be the one song. of the worst defenses in football. They are, and they are, and you know, and I think it is again the injuries, but you know, the defensive line play not up to snuff. Some of the young rookies, you know, they've been exposed with I think a little bit of like you know NFL life. Not exactly knowing the rules, what to do. Maybe D- Wink Martindale doesn't want to be too exotic with them at points because it's just too much as rookies. You know, there's a lot of things I can certainly look at, but it has not been good. And that's, you know, hopefully can get fixed and change if they get a little healthier here. Do you- I do believe, like, Calais Campbell mm-hmm. is not playing nearly at 100%. I watch him closely yesterday. Right. He's, he's playing, but he's, like, at 80%. I don't think Brandon Williams is all the way back yet either. So... Uh, we'll see if they can kind of improve on those those little categories or areas uh, as we go here. Ready to take a look at the other side of this? I think so. You know, le- you know last thing here. Mm-hmm. Last thing, because there was so much talk about Cleveland left too much time on the clock, right? You know, late in the game and let Baltimore have the ball so Justin Tucker could go kick, you know, kick the field goal and do all those type of things. So impressed with the Browns, what they did. 
I'm not going to get mad at him for that. For for so like let, let's Talking break it down. Drive. That last drive, yeah, they scored really quick, right? They scored four plays, 75 yards, 47 seconds it took them, and when they scored, there was a minute and four seconds left. So all right, let's go back to that and like break it down. Here we go. The first play, it's a deep. He throws a deep ball to Peoples Jones mm-hmm. at for 30 yards. Okay, Baltimore calls timeout. There's a minute 44 left now. Next play, short pass right to Jarvis Landry, pushed out of bounds, seven yards. Okay, clock's not moving, so that right. stops. Okay, 138, pass short left to Kareem Hunt to the Baltimore 22 for 16 yards. All right, now that's where they messed up. Okay. How so? Well, they got the first down, and that's when they should have gone, let's let the clock run all the way down. We have all our timeouts, and we're on the 22-yard line. You know, and when you really break down the math there, like they could have snapped that ball that they scored the touchdown on. They could have snapped it with 47 seconds left on the game clock, okay. maybe 46 seconds left on the game clock. So, yeah, but... I, it's not too egregious. I see you yeah. shaking your head because you're going, you're being picky. Well, you're right. Always, yeah. Well, and they didn't intend. Listen, the next play, they threw a six yard throw. Right. They weren't trying to score right there. Right. You know, they weren't going, we got to score now or the game's over. They were, they were going to play the patient game. Mm-hmm. But the corner for the Ravens is not good, Devontae Harris, who we just talked about. Kareem Hunt is arguably one of the five or six or seven best running backs in the game, and he makes a miss and scores. So it's not one where I'm going to go, Man, Stefanski, and what are you doing? No, you're not even in the mode of telling your running back, hey, if you catch the ball on the six-yard play and get to the one-yard line, go down. Right. And I wouldn't tell him to go down anyways because you're playing Baltimore, and who knows if you get in. You just struggled getting in earlier in the game from there. Right. So uh, I, I'm not, I think people are being a little too nitpicky with that, that situation. And I always think, too, Chris, like just in the abstract, not this game specifically, yeah. that that argument, oh, they scored too quickly – you're trying to score, period. Exactly. You don't get to match. Touchdowns it out. aren't guaranteed. Let's get down to the eight right. and take a minute off the clock, and then we'll score on fourth down. Like you score when when you get to score. Yes. Like, I, I don't think that that argument has any teeth to it in most games, and especially in this game. I mean, like you pointed out, Kareem Hunt makes somebody miss. I mean, go ahead and score. Exactly. Exactly. It's, so, it's okay. And let's not forget. I mean, they were this close. You know, they you know it, it, they had to make a great kick to win the game. I know it's Justin Tuck, and he's one of the best ever, and uh, all of that. Justin Tucker, I said yes. Tuck. I'm getting my Tuck, my Maybe Tucks you guys mixed really up on that level. Yeah, I call him Tuck. <laughs> but uh, but uh, I mean, I, I think that is being nitpicky. Is all I'm saying. The Completely. only thing you could talk about was after that second down conversion for the first down. May, yes, they could have let the clock go down there. All right, yes, but I'm not going to sit here and Even blame Stefanski. Nit- nitpicky, I think. Yeah, it, it is nitpicky because, again, you don't know what's going to happen so right. far. You know, you're only in the 22 yard line. You could get a first down and get to the 10 yard line and then have a whole other set of plays. So you're not sure exactly what you're going to need at that moment either. So I'm with mm-hmm. you. I just wanted to bring it up because there's been a lot of conversation around it. You know what just got whispered in my ear, which is always good news? Yeah. Big Phil's on the line. Whoop, whoop. Phil, you there, pal? I am here. I'm listening. In what situation I caught the end of it? You talking about and everybody's talking about. Well, the end of the game, a lot of people were trying to get on Cleveland for scoring too fast to tie the football game at 42, right? Because you should know now that Lamar Jackson all of a sudden is this two-minute surgeon general, and, you know, they have Justin Tuck, which – Justin Tucker, excuse me, (laughs) which I understand, but – yeah, I just think people are being a little too critical of that one altogether. That is uh, the understatement of the year. Yeah. They're being critical. I mean, that's another word. What I'm saying is that's the overstatement, I should say. Yeah. Yes, exactly First right. Time. Exactly you know, right. You scored too quick. I actually had my college coach once say that to us. Y'all know this at halftime. We knew, you know, we were terrible. Offense, you're scoring too fast. <laughs> defense needs <laughs> Whoa, okay. And we still lost the game. But. Yeah, but that, that's, the, the, you know, now you're nitpicking, uh, pulling things apart, and just overanalyzing what goes on in the game. Right. And so that, that, right. That's my only comment. Yep. How's everything? I mean, how are you doing? 
Uh, it's Paul today. It's not Ahmed. It's okay. Oh, sorry, well, I haven't heard him talking. It's, it's all right. right. It's all right. It's okay, Phil. I'm doing uh, well. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Are you in I state, Paul. You keeping in shape? You doing that? Are you getting old and sloppy? What are you doing? Well, I, I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to fight that off. It's 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 not the easiest thing to do. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, that, that part of it's going okay. Trying to keep up all with right. my wife. Trying to look good oh, with Chris go. out here. He's looking good. He's smooth. Neither one of those things are, are easy. But we were we were just turning the corner from the Browns offense into the Ravens offense from that game Monday night. Before we talk Lamar and Baltimore, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what Baker Mayfield and Kevin Stefanski not only did on Monday, but just have been doing here these last few weeks. They do what they have to do to win the game. And, you know, people got on, uh, you know, I heard it all three straight weeks, Baker, so few completions. Well, they were playing in, you know, uh, incredibly bad um, right. situations with the weather. Right. Let's don't take that into account because that ruins the story. <laughs> and um, that's one thing. And and you do what you have to do to win. And every team does it. And uh, you know, there's only a few exceptions. So they know to win the game. They're gonna. They want to run the football, protect their defense a little, play this certain way. But they've made great decisions when they go. You know, we got to do more than just run the ball this week. And when they've opened it up, Baker's answered the questions. That's it. And and I did a thing on CBS last week or two weeks ago or last week. The fact they run the ball, he's getting more space to throw. And Christopher and Paul, you guys talk about it all the time. It spreads out for him down the field. Right. And he's been terrific. And he's not overthrowing, which was a problem last year. Yeah. He, I mean, he couldn't throw it hard enough. Right. And the other thing I thought um, – who did the game? That was Monday night. Yeah, that was yeah. greasy and, you know, yeah. yeah. I thought they made a great point that, listen, he, on the run, he's been really terrific throwing the football. Right. That, 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 of course, that's a big key. We don't take into account his mobility, which he does have a very quick, sudden first or two steps to get him out of trouble and then still fast enough to do what he did right. to run for the touchdown. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He's not a blazer, but I think Dad says it right. He's got a great explosive first step or two to get out of the pocket, and that's the biggest thing. And then, yes, throwing on the run, important in today's NFL, as you know, just to extend plays, but it's a huge part of their offense because of they run bootlegs and want the quarterback to be on the move to make a number of throws through the game, and he is. He's great at it, like to what Dad says. Right. Yeah, yes, and then let's let's all just remember, and everybody were, which too many people are trying to treat this. Oh, Cleveland, we picked them to win the Super Bowl, so they're judging them in such a. Uh, I just wonder sometimes, you know, that they are. Did we think they would be where they are right now? Nine Before and four, they were nine and three could have been ten and three. Whatever you'd be going, and no, they're not going to win the Super Bowl. I know that. I really feel confident in saying that. I like to step out on limbs every once in a while. And, uh, <laughs> but so I take it for what they are that they've made an unbelievable step forward. And it's real what we're seeing. Right. And I have to tell you, Kevin Stefanski, I don't know. I did, he's really done a great job with the football team. He made yep. a great report. But they're playing well. But he's putting them in position to play well. Yes. And players of course Paul all of us we love people who put us in position to succeed right and so that even bonds you closer so he's done a great job uh, you know both sides of the ball of course the defense I wish it could just stouten up just a little more but it's been a great season so far for Cleveland no you're right dad we just kind of broke down the Browns offense versus the Ravens you know you, you kind of you know summed it all up he keeps you off balance he runs the ball at a, at a patient enough clip and knows that's his bread and butter, but he's not going to run it so much or be so predictable that you're going to be able to, you know, hold, you know, hold the feet to the fire to go, oh, I think this, you know, they're going to run it. He does a great job that way in attacking, too. That's the other yes. thing. He attacks. Yeah, they're not, uh, yeah, when he moves or anything like that, even when he drops back, he, they are an aggressive down-the-field throwing team which I love, which really fits in perfectly with a run offense. Right. If you're a good running team, then when you throw it, I want to see, you know, hammer throws. Definitely. Man, let it go. Let's, let's get big plays to really make it both, both things of your offense match. Right. But that's been really good, too, and it's, um, you know, it, it's amazing. The Cleveland Browns are 
talked about and everything as much as the Dallas Cowboys are. And it's like they're, they're like the Dallas Cowboys now. We everybody talks about them every week. This the quarterback, the coach, whatever it is, good, bad, and for not being one of the big, what do you want to call it, markets in the NFL. Right. They get a lot of attention for the size of their market. They do. Their NFL, you know, old school history yeah, type of football team. team. Mm-hmm. That that's yep. for sure. You know, Dad's right about, you know, we, we brought it up. You know, the other aggressive passing teams in football is big play every time. They run the ball. The Titans. You think about the Minnesota Vikings. He doesn't throw a lot of five-yard completions. It's either Dalvin Cook for 10 or we're throwing for a 30-yard completion. So that goes hand-in-hand. Hand. And this is the other thing, too, because I know Dad and I have defended Baker throughout the year for, like, everybody just to chill out a little bit. We're not going to, you know, let, cut him at the end of the year and draft Trevor Lawrence because, you know, it's been three years of just okay with Baker. You know, you're, you can develop into being a superstar. There is such a thing. The guy that everybody calls the GOAT, the greatest thing in the history of football, right? Tom Brady. Everybody forgets they won three Super Bowls running the ball and playing defense. And then he became, yeah. hey, you know, Tom, we're not as good this year. We need you to get in the shotgun and start throwing it and carrying us and, and doing it that way. And then he was capable of doing that. But, you know, we all want, like, Dan Marino or Mahomes. And I want to just go, no, that's, like, two guys in the history of the sport. Right. And that's it. Like, so that's not going to happen with everybody else. And he also yeah, has his uh, it, it, it's it, It's the old phrase, Paul, we could sit here and we could do it for hours. Let's just put another cliche up there. Hey, this is the game where I'm really, this is going to show it tonight in prime time. I got to see it. He's done it nine weeks in a row, but that doesn't count because tonight is prime time. I, you know, which I truly like, oh, man, I want to turn the TV off. I just, oh, my God. When people say things like that. Yes, Baker's played great. But, you know, or Josh Allen. But i got to see it this week before yeah. I'm really convinced. Right. Oh, my God. Right. He also has this but thing then, going for him, too, where, I mean, in one way you can say you know he's always going to compete, he's always going to have confidence. But it was no surprise after he threw that bad pick, he was at his best in the drives after it. That yeah. You, you know he's going to come back and play that way. And that's got nothing to do with the play calling or how strong his arm is. He's got that, uh, that that fortitude that you love to have in a quarterback. Well, he does. Well, he, he's, yeah. he's been, yeah. listen, he's been, oh, you're too short, you can't do this, all those things his whole life. So he does have an attitude. There is no question. Uh, I don't have to talk to him or talk to any teammates. I can see the change in Baker Mayfield, of course, in his play. The offense fits him great, but his personality on the field and how real it is on the field, and I see it off the field too. And uh, it, it, so that means he's growing up. Yep. Uh, he's really being coached right, and the team's in order. I mean, we interviewed Miles Garrett on Showtime a few weeks ago, and, you know, it was unbelievable. His attitude and, you know, everything, how happy he was, and you could just tell, man, they were – uh, they were in a great place, and they still are down in Cleveland. Yeah, that speaks to Dad what Dad said with Stefanski, because that's what he's done. I mean, they've, they've, they're a mature football team. There's no nonsense. Yeah, they really are. They, yeah. they, they are. That's a, that's a great point, Christopher. They're mature. and But that's what happens when a coach comes in. You know, we had a little discussion, you know, do you have to relate to these players? Oh, you know, come on. Let's stop that. Uh, you know, how, how are these old guys doing? You know, all like, oh, you got to be the same age as the player to relate to them. Players, when you make them better, when you walk in the room, they go, oh, there's the man. Right. He, mm-hmm. look, and that's what they do. Great coaches make good players g- great, and then they take great players and make them superstars. Right. Andy Reid, Sean Payton, whatever. You, no. th- There's... There's a small group that can do it. Bill Belichick, maybe not as much as him because they don't just focus on a certain group maybe as much, but these guys make superstars out of really good players. Yeah. And the, a lot of them are going to the Hall of Fame because uh, – I'll give you a real quick and Don't beat this. I wanna, I'm going to talk about this weekend. But okay. Go ahead. Patrick Mahomes. Let's yeah. just take him. Right. Now, how many teams – Give me the answer as soon as I ask this question, both of you. Yep. How many teams would allow him to play an offense like this and be who he is? Yeah, no. right. I mean, I, I mean, just real uh, quickly, two or three. Who? Who? I, maybe Sean Payton. Yes, he would have. Yes. Right? That's, uh, yes. I'd probably well. say, like, Doug Peterson probably would have. Yeah, no. But, yeah, I, you, know, you know, after that, I don't know. You know, uh, you maybe what about this? Let me hear one more. I mean, because you might 
Brian Dayball, maybe, up at the Buffalo Bills. Okay. You know what? I eat my words. Okay. But that's it. That might be it. Yeah. <laughs> Paul, I mean, do you agree? I mean, can you – who's going to hand over the reins? Oh, you know, you can't be running around doing these throws and or design an offense where we don't have – Let's design one that really does a lot of stuff and get down the field. Right. And of course, he enhances it by making sure there's always great talent around it. That's we know that. Right. But yeah. I don't think there's another one. I mean, personnel-wise, they have some some uh, good fortune going the for them there as well. I'm just talking about the coach. The coach. I mean, Will the coach do and open it up and let him be the guy that he was in college, right. which he is now yeah. in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, That's he's, the difference. Yeah, he, he's with the number one guy who has a history also. I mean, Patrick is the most talented one, but he made Donovan McNabb the best he was in his yes. career. He made yes. Alex Smith the best he was in his yeah, career. Yeah, definitely. Uh, in their little time together, Nick Foles was really, really good with Andy Reid. So he has a history of this with a lot of quarterbacks. Now you yeah. give him the most talented guy in the league with a tight end like Kelsey and a talent like Hill, and it makes perfect sense that it's working. But I don't think there's another one out there uh, with the resume no. or with what he's doing now that would make him or would, would use him in a better way. Yeah. No. Bruce Arians, Dad. What about Bruce Arians? He might have too. That might have been a third one. That maybe. In his prime, he might have let They'd him go. They don't love to have him, but I mean. <laughs> no. You know, I, I don't know. I don't – I just I, – I just – I think Bruce has his offense or whatever, and yes, Mahomes would have been great at running it, but it wouldn't have been the unbelievable freedom. Yeah, you're you know, probably right. I say right. all this, too, just because of this, and I didn't say it last week and or whatever. Sometime I do two shows, you think I'd get these things out. But, you know, Mahomes, as I really watch him, and just go, I just write down and go, my God, <laughs> what if he couldn't move? <laughs> it just... It, it's 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 a little not alarming, but you know there people beat their offensive line at a much higher rate than we think. Oh, I'm so glad you're saying we're going to break that game down a little bit, and it, it's one of the things I wrote in my notes is that we don't talk about the averted disasters that he avoids because we're so used to seeing it. Right. We don't yeah. even care anymore. We had, the Super Bowl. Right. Forget that game, which was unbelievable. When I watched the second time, I go, oh, my God. He was like, whatever. He was getting destroyed, but he hung in there, whatever. Think back to the Raider game in Las Vegas, how they yes. were hitting him so often as he threw, and he made so many key throws in that game. It was unbelievable. And, you know, the, the Raiders – they're going to beat them. They're going to beat them. No, I think they're going to beat them. Oh, what a play on third and nine. My right. God. Yeah. And, but, you know, not much said about it because we take it for granted. We've seen it so much. It doesn't stand out as being special. No, right. you're right. That's really what it is. He's, he's made us numb to it. Hey, thinking about Mahomes avoiding disaster, Phil, I, I, I want to get it to this here. He's the first player to lose 30-plus yards on a sack with that 30-yard sack. Without fumbling since Phil Sims on November 18, 1979, against the Buccaneers. Uh, yes, you remember? Thank you. I knew that. Yes. I, I How'd you allow that to happen? But we did play down in Tampa in '79. They were a good team. We beat them. My first start, I beat them. We were they were five and zero, oh, and I think we were we might have been zero oh and five. I'm not sure. Or one. You're on five. Yep. One. We were zero oh and five, and of course I tore it up six of 12 for 37 yards not after him three yards for attempt. Yeah. yeah but but we went down there and it was wow thank god that game was on grass but i don't remember the sack i can't imagine did i fumble it and pick it up and or something i don't know i don't know earlier in your career you did have a little bit of that you did it a few times where i've seen highlights of you running around back there and you know more times than not it was a few good ones like I know there's a oh, Dallas yeah. Cowboys in 79 against Roger Stallback. You did that same damn thing and somehow pulled it off and threw like a 40-yard completion. So, Yeah, no, I did it much more early in my career. And, you know, all that, hindsight, we're always, like I always say, we're a genius. But I just go, why didn't I stay that way? I know. <laughs> my my you know mom, why, my mom clear. said it. The other day. What'd you say? She goes, you know, we were sitting in bed the other night, and Dad and I, we were, you, I don't know, they were watching a game or whatever. And she goes, Dad regrets he didn't scramble more in his career. <laughs> Were you told not to? I, I really moved around my first you did. years. Everybody, keep him in the pocket. I can remember coaches yelling, as I, and I just go. And then you know what happened? I know what happened. And I, I don't want to get into this. I'm sorry. But I got, I got hurt, 
And so I thought, well, I'm just going to get bigger so I don't get hurt, which really probably is the exact opposite of what I should have done. Um, but I didn't know at the time, and it, it changed me, you know, of course. But, yeah, my rookie year, we played the Los Angeles Rams. Rams. They're good. They went to the Super Bowl a year. I'm running down the field, duking them, man, just shaking them. <laughs> and, you know, I laugh when I see them. I go, I, and I said, damn, I should have kept that up. But, oh, well. That's great. So what, what did Parcells think of you running so much when you were young? Did he like that? Well, I didn't run much. He Parcells wasn't there he yet. There. Yeah, yeah. So the great Ray Perkins was there, who just That's passed right. away. R.I.P. to oh, him. No, poor Ray. Yeah. Yep. Listen, I owe so much to Ray Perkins. Do you think George Young would have had the courage to draft me? It was just strictly his pick, and the answer is no. So he gave in to Ray Perkins, who wanted me. He let he said, "Well, it's a new head coach. We're in here. I can't get off on the wrong foot." So he let Ray Perkins make the pick, and it was me. And there's, you know, George. Nothing against him. I'm not. It's just George liked Big Ten, SEC. He wanted the safe pick, you know, when he when it, when it came to those first round guys, especially early, or that, or if you're huge, he liked that too. So, but yeah, so I, Ray Perkins and I. It was he was as rough as there could be, uh, but he had great belief in what he did, and it's sad that he did pass away. All right, so what do you want to do here? You want to talk about Lamar and the Ravens and have Dad listen to this real quick, or Dad, do you want to just get the hell out of here and you've had enough talking to us? <laughs> no, no, go ahead. I'm, I'm, hey, listen, I'm breaking down the Giants and the Arizona Cardinals, so Ooh, we're doing that. Later. Yeah, we're going to do that it's in a little bit. It's, yeah, it's not a lot of fun. No, it's not. There's not a lot <laughs> it's of not a good watch. There's not a lot of great things there. You're right. No, there really isn't, and you know, I don't, well, whatever. Well, don't talk about it because yeah, we're going to talk about it. <laughs> All right. Want to talk about Lamar just to his side? We're, what? Yep. Go ahead. Let's start oh. it off. I, I, I'm sorry. I had Pete talking to me too. So yeah, we're doing the Ravens offense. Okay, let's go. go. Back to the Ravens yep. offense. Here we go. Okay, Lamar was at his uh, most effective, most exciting. He's the, I think he's the AFC Offensive Player of the Week for right. that effort uh, on on Monday night. You want, you want to bat lead off here, or do you want your old man to? No, yeah, I'm going to bat lead off here. Okay. It's my f***ing show, right? All right, so we here we go. We talked <laughs> Baker. Whoa, whoa. We talked Baker. <laughs> no. That was a little uh, rough. Not rough. That was like Conviction. Combative. Yeah. Okay. That yes. was some conviction there. Okay, so you, your lead with Lamar is? My lead with Lamar, and Dad, chime in here anything you want to hit on. Right. First off, it, it's just too much Lamar-centric. It, the, the whole offense, everything. It's just too much. It's, it's him. I mean, let's just take the first drive of the game. Yep. The first drive of the game, nothing schematically works. Nothing. No, no. It's just Lamar, hey, in the backyard, you know, or out on the beach, you know, like we saw in the offseason, jumping over jet skis and stuff. It's just that's what he's doing. Oh, I don't know. Nobody's going to help me. I'll just make it happen myself. Not sustainable? I, not, I don't think that is sustainable. I don't. You know, there's just of course it's not. Yeah, of yeah. course it's not. It's right, especially against, you know, upper tier teams in the AFC. Definitely not. Dad's right about that. You know, lack of pass game, still an issue, of course. Yeah, were there some big throws in the football game? Yeah, but the two biggest throws of the game happened why? Because Lamar scrambled yep. and made something happen, yeah. right? So there there's still that issue. Now the one thing that was really impressive about the game, man, the first thing I would say, Cleveland, did you know you were playing Lamar Jackson? Were, were, were we aware that it was Lamar Jackson? Did they think they were getting Trace McSorley? Questionable scheme against him. What? Yeah. It's like they didn't talk about containing him in the drop back pass game. It's like there was no discussion. The linebackers don't pay attention to him. The pass rush has, you know, no discipline at all. They're just they're going after him like it's Tom Brady and he can't move. Especially interesting because we spent so much time and Phil, you can jump in here with this too. Right. This last month talking about how teams were getting smart about playing against rushing against Russell Wilson or Kyler Murray. I mean, none of those yes, type of concepts were, were going on yeah. Monday night. None of those concepts were going on at well, all. You know, I, I think what happened, I yeah. think Cleveland said, you know, on Sunday we watched that Philadelphia uh, Saints game, so let's do what they did. Let's just, just don't worry about the quarterback. Let's just run and get this, get a sack <laughs> and all that. And he, oh, my gosh, what were they thinking? Everybody from the yes. Saints, really the same thought with Cleveland. Right. And as I watched, I haven't studied the tape yet, but I will today. But you're Friday, right. I love Wednesdays. But the thing that I did notice of one thing that really jumped out on the screen, you know, the slipping was one thing by Lamar. But he was extremely lean, and it's arguably maybe the fastest I've ever seen him. He did look fast. 
Yeah. Okay, so, you know, and I think if you go back, I'd love to take a picture of what he looked like on Monday night and go back and look early in the year. Yeah, and it's like know, Deshaun I Watson. Say, Deshaun Watson, too. Same thing. They got him faster saying, as the year went on. Yes, I would say 10 pounds. Right. And Listen, he is supposed to be wiry and the way he is right now. And he was, his footwork, his speed, and all that. And, you know, Christopher and Paul, look, it's over. This is who they are. Right. And they're, they're, it's too late. Three games, you're not going to develop another passing game. If you develop anything, how about some screens or sure. something? Sure. I don't know. Just something, just some easy plays. Play action I, pass. They don't even have that. I mean, gosh. think, they're, the, they're yeah. one of the best running teams we've seen in football. How many the last two years? You can't – when I just said that, yeah. you were trying to go, wait, I, you're Why right. I don't that? ever see them do a play-action pass. Yeah. And when they do do a play-action pass, their offensive line just slides one way, and he just put, put, puts his hands out. Yeah. So the linebackers don't even buy it because they see the offensive line pass blocking. Yeah. Makes, yeah. No, make, that's so true. And they run I, – I don't know. I, listen, they're doing wonderfully under Greg Roman. Yeah, we can complain. But the tight end on a slight bender across the field, here comes the seam, here comes the other Exactly field. right. I right. Mean, oh, my God, I've seen that play. I saw it on TV the other night. I go, they wear that play out. Yes, they and it was really a killer for them for a long time. And they used to do it out of play action, I've seen it. But he always seems to hit Mark Andrews on that little over, right over the top of somebody. It's like one of the best things he throws. Definitely, far. right. Uh, but, yeah, the lack of the pass game. So they just got to figure out really this – Quit worrying about it, and just keep working on your run game. So here's a here's yeah. a question. I, I, yeah, I agreed. Uh, you're you're right, Dad. So the, the, it's question, Phil, from yeah. Twitter plays right into what you're saying. Uh, Raleigh Raleigh is the handle. Asks, could a different offensive coordinator get passing production out of the Ravens receiver group, or do they need to invest more in the wide receivers? Uh, well, I think no. I think that the, there has to be something done with the offensive passing game. Yes. No. Yeah. There are definitely coordinators that would get more out of the passing game. Mm-hmm. Now, would they get the same out of the running game? No, because Greg no. Roman's special in the running game. You yeah. have to give yeah. him that. But I, I mean, I don't want to. Dad and I have had this conversation. Baltimore, to me, is a team that they need to bring in a passing game coordinator when the season's over. You have to. Yeah. They've just got to just, expand you that don't way. Need much. Right. It, it just a, a few really good concepts, and of course, you switch them up a little bit here and there every week. Not a lot of, you know, brain work, that's for sure. You know, designing pass plays and a few concepts, literally I believe I could do it right now. I could go to a board on an NFL team and draw up, you know, four or five things that you must have in your offense. Right. You must. What would be on there at the top? You must be great at them. Everybody in the league has them. I'm watching, who, well, I'm watching the Arizona Cardinals, and I see <clears> them run a play, and I go, Hell, we put that in in 1981 with Ron Earhart. <laughs> Identical. Right. Uh, so, you know, the double crosser, in cut behind, pre-snap read to come back to one side if you want it, whatever. I mean, it's, it's – so, I, you know, that can be easily done. It really can. And when it does happen, Lamar's not going to turn into a great pocket-throwing quarterback. He is very capable. He can spin it. He has power on his arm. Yep. It can get a lot better, but when does it happen? I guess it's, it's, when do you think it'll happen? Why will it happen? When he slows down just a little bit. Yes, yeah, right. Where that running is just not, hey, you know, I don't like it, I'm going. You know, that. When that slows down a little bit, he'll now determine, hey, I'm going to stand in here, and he'll give a receiver maybe a second look or do whatever mm-hmm. instead of just taking off because he knows he can take off and get it done. Yeah. So, he no did doubt. do that on right. that final drive that led to the field goal. All four of those completions were from him in the pocket, and we hadn't seen that the whole game. They were. They were, they were nice. You know, they got, they got Cleveland in a little bit of a per- yeah. prevent defense, and, hey, we're lining up in this, and here you go, and they got it going that way. But, you know, to, to expand on the game just a little bit, here, here's one thing. Just, you know, first off, this Brown, dad talked about, the Browns defensive line. It's not a good run-stopping defensive line. So they're, they're compromised already there. Their linebackers at the second level are really not good. Okay, I'm just—it's way below NFL yeah, average. They, they got—they got some names. 
they put them in there, whatever, yes, it's definitely an issue. It's an issue. So yeah. there's that aspect. So they don't match up well with Baltimore from that aspect. We talked about no plan for Lamar, really. And then what really happened, Baltimore found one scheme that just troubled them throughout the night. And that was anything pulling guard. Mm. And there was two different ways they did it, or pulling linemen, I should say. Right? They did the old, hey, everybody on the front side, block down, block down, block down, backside guard, pull. Okay, they were very successful with a lot of the J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards runs. All right? right. Then the other aspect is they'll pull the center and the weak side tackle, right, and do that. Right. It's very effective. But the biggest plays of the night were the wrinkles off of that. Okay? So Lamar Jackson's um, first touchdown of the night. All right, he is, or let me just make sure, uh, no, no, it's, it's the, the second touchdown of the night, okay. excuse me, all right, it's the Gus Edwards 11-yard run, all right. all right, this play, Gus Edwards is on the right of Lamar Jackson, he's on the right, they're in the shotgun, right, the right. center and the right tackle are going to pull to the left, now you're thinking, hey, he's going to give the ball to Gus Edwards, Gus Edwards is going to follow those two big mother effers hmm. that are running up in there, but they throw you a curveball, and he keeps it out the back door, okay, for a huge run and a huge play. That was their big wrinkle of the night. If you remember, 424, uh, in the third quarter, there was a play where Lamar, on their first touchdown drive to go up 28-14, he's got a third down run. Now it's the same thing, but they switched, they switched roles. Two, now two, the lineman pulled to the right, mm -hmm. and... Gus, I mean, Edwards goes to the left to control the backside end, and now Lamar doesn't follow the two bolt pullers. He goes to that weak side gap because they're overplaying the linebackers so much to stop those yeah. two pulling guards that this is how you keep them honest. Mm. And really, it was those two run plays and Lamar Jackson making plays scrambling that won the football for them, right. uh, you know, won the game for them on the offensive side of the ball. It's really yeah, not much, point. yeah, it's not much more than that. Yeah, well, I have not seen it and watched the tape of it. I did, now that you said it, I said, yeah, in my mind, I can see the plays during the game. And, uh, yeah, just the way you're explaining it is very clever. So, you know, they have, and I think so many people in the league, Paul and Christopher, that have copied, I think, some of the concepts that we saw from the Ravens with Lamar. Definitely. And, you know, they don't have the running quarterback, but they're still doing all the looks, the movement, the, the you know, the Block down one way, kick out the other, whatever you want to say. They right. Were, their, their offense last year, it was like the shell game. Where is it? Because it, everybody was moving, three guys in the backfield. You know, that three tight end set they were using was just tremendous. Yes. So they don't have that this year. It's uh, it turned into a little bit simpler, I should say. But I, uh, I, read, I did it many weeks ago. I was started writing down all the teams where I said, "Oh, they didn't run this before. They got this from Baltimore." Definitely, it's it's, it's yeah, yeah. That's it why is, teams it's, have gotten better defending it. Well, that's true too. You know, that is, that's, the that's Buffalo Bills thing. they see Josh Allen and the offense do it in practice once a week, so they've got to see it. Oh, Deshaun yeah. Watson and the Texans do it now, so now their defense gets to see it. So the de league is caught up because people have stole these plays to dad's point right and that's, that's what always happens you know right. that's why you got to keep every year you got to create your team and who you're going to be and uh, i'll let you go at this so too the other game on sunday night just watching it at christopher yeah all he was all over just going i want to see buffalo just keep throwing it keep throwing it and it does happen the pittsburgh defense if you i, I don't know statistically i'm going to look at it later today but they do start to tire out, and they give up plays more and more as the game goes along. And the biggest thing is they were overrunning a little bit the, the Buffalo offensive line early. Yeah. Not running over them, but you're not pushing the pocket too fast. But that stopped, and then Josh Allen was getting the second looks. And, right. You know, he was, he was crushing it with right. those second looks. No doubt. And I've never really – the last thing, even – I never see a guy throw 18-yard out cuts, 30-yard throws – with such less effort, really, maybe in my whole career, in, of everybody, than he does. Wow. And Agreed. Again, we don't know what we're looking at. In other words, oh, well, there, okay. No, that was special. 
very few guys can do that and do it with such ease. Right. And it's, you know, it's... Um, Even the touchdown, uh, like he throws, the in the oh. third quarter, the whole shot into the back left of the end zone. You know, that, that's, well, it's, it's only Mahomes and Rodgers. Yeah. I really think that's it. Only yeah, other two that, guys, that, yeah. That, that is true. That, that was a great little movement. That was a little... I'm sorry, my... Got distracted. Yeah, he that gave was, a little that little faint. Right, made, that's two weeks in a row. He did it against San Francisco. Caught Richard Sherman. Right, who was late in the game, looking to make a play. That's who. So he knew who he was, and that little thing. And Richard Sherman squared his feet, and then of course it's over once you do that. Yep. And I thought Richard Sherman, who's turned into such a figurehead for the Forty ers for real, after the game just said, "Hey, you know they're good." Yeah. And, you know he just gave them credit, didn't moan and groan about it, and. Hey, you're a corner. You're going to give up things. But he did the right thing, too, though, Paul and Christopher. He did the right thing by looking for a gamble to try to get him back in the game. Yeah, sure. To do right. that. But you have to do that sometimes. No, as a, as a no doubt. He did it the week before against the Rams and got an interception. So it's, it works for him. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right, look, i got to run. You guys, thank you. Paul, All right, Dad. feel good to talk to you. You're the man, Dad. All right, Christopher, talk see, to you. See you, man. Okay. See Take you. care. Um, all right, let's just button this up. Yep. I was – the first touchdown run, mm-hmm. okay, that I talked about was that double lineman pulling, okay? And just yeah. if you want to see it here, yes. just so you can mental image look at it, right? Yep. So here you go. This one, it's the left guard and the left tackle pull. He keeps it and follows them behind them, right? Right. So that was the big play of the, of the game for them. And then what they started to do was, okay, now you want to overplay that, then Lamar would keep it over there. I think it's right? an interesting play on, on what, what you expect the linebacker to do. Because is, is a linebacker exactly. taught to just follow the pulling lineman, or is he looking at that play action? Because Lamar is faking the run to the left. It's a, it's a really tough. The ball. Yes. You have to do something special on defense there. Yeah. It has to be in a different alignment. The, the, the linebacker's in a, a spot of no win in some of those defense alignments. Yeah. First off, when two guards pull over, they're thinking, wait, now there's going to be two extra gaps to the strong side. But if so they're people need the ball. to do that. I know if they're watching the ball. But it's hard to watch that with keys of linemen going away, yeah. you know, running backs going one way. And it, it is. It's very hard to watch the ball there because – other thing that people don't realize, if you get into let's watch the ball all the time, you're going to get tricked with that stuff too. Mm-hmm. And then you're really going to be off. So, you know, that's, it's a great schematical design in which the Ravens do there to keep you off of one of their bread and butter runs. And that was the name of the game. That whether it was one pulling guard or two weak side pulling linemen and, you know, what they did with that when they ran behind those pulling guards or – the two times they faked, we're not going to run behind him and go the other way because you're overplaying it. That really gashed them. Now, like, let's get back. Let's get to the bread and butter, the 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 big play to tie the football game. Okay. Lamar Jackson, Willis Reed moment, right? All yeah. that. Yeah. Because that's that is amazing in itself too, and it's amazing. Really, one of course we know because he got out there and, and played. And we have but, the animation of this too. Oh, let's let's do along. that. Let's do that. So. Uh, you know, first off, pause it at the start here, Nicole, if you can. Don't let it go. Start back from the beginning to where I can watch it one more time. There we go. So right now, the way this looks, you see all the guys at the line of scrimmage. It, yeah. it, it's, it's, a, it's a what, a fourth and four here, basically, I think we're at, basically, at that point, right? You got it. And, you know, a lot of people at the line of scrimmage, you see there's only three guys back in the secondary. That should alert a quarterback to go, wait, something's – you know, fishy here. They, they, it seems like they're going to blitz a lot of people. A lot of people at the line of scrimmage. I mean, you basically see eight people within two and a half yards of the line of scrimmage. Now, the other aspect of this that I think is awesome is Baltimore obviously expected this. And here's what's awesome. Baltimore's five linemen are all going to slide left and pick up the blitz. Almost everybody. Now, there's, there's six blitzers, but two of them go through the same gap and kind of get washed away. So now, let's go back just a little bit more, if you can, Nicole, and start back one more time for me. All right, so here's the last thing before we start. I want everybody to pay attention to Olivier Vernon on the right hash, number 54. He is like, he is, he wants the blitz, but he's responsible for the back if the back goes out on the route. Okay. Okay. And you see 54 there on the right hash, right over number 83. Yep. Sneed at receiver. Now they're thinking we're sending six blitzers. So they only have five linemen. 
J.K. Dobbins should have to block, right? He should have to block. Mm -hmm. Baltimore goes, let's just slide the whole O-line. And Lamar, no, we're one short. But what happens is now roll the tape a little bit here and let's keep your eye on 54. He's got to go run after the back. They're not expecting him to get out. And therefore, when he runs to go get to the back, he runs into his own player, Terrence Mitchell, which knocks him off of Hollywood Brown, which leads to the touchdown. Is it fundamentally sound, considering Lamar's your quarterback, to, to say, we're going we're, we're gonna to turn one free. That's fine. Our one, Lamar Jackson, is better than your free rusher. At least they turned him away. They turned their one free rusher away from the three receivers to where he can run to his right yeah. to avoid it. So if you're, it, it's not necessarily smart. But in this situation, it's not horrible when you have a guy like him. And they have some short routes here to get the ball out of his hand quickly, too, if he wants to. Like, as soon as he broke the pocket, he could have thrown to Miles Boykin. He could have thrown to J.K. Dobbins, who Olivier Vernon right. was. Or he could have just ran. But the other thing, too, because I had friends like texting me, like, how do they not contain Lamar Jackson on that play right there? Well, that's why Olivier Vernon was there. They're thinking... Dobbins is going to blitz. Olivier Vernon's on the edge. He's going to be there to not let Lamar run that way. But since they figured out how to get the back out, that changed everything. And then Lamar, he just moves to his right because he goes, wait, there's a lot of guys coming from this side. Let me just get out of here. And then he starts to get out of there. And he goes, whoa, nobody's over here. Right. And then he has the great jo- does the great job of uh, seeing Hollywood downfield. Because even, even though Vernon was lined up to the right, I mean, he came crashing down to the middle and to the other side. So, I mean, he, he, he was in no position to contain him at all from his first step. Well, he's on the edge to Lamar's right. Yeah. He's over there. But he didn't stay there. No, he couldn't stay there because he saw J.K. Dobbins running out right away. So he couldn't stay. Because if he doesn't, you know, he's, J.K. Dobbins is going to catch the ball and walk in for a touchdown. He's got no, they got nothing there. I mean, even if Lamar threw it to J.K. Dobbins on rhythm, he's probably still going to score up the sideline. It's going to have to run, outrun Olivier Vernon. And J.K. Dobbins, who runs 4-3, I like his chances against Olivier Vernon. Yeah. So that, to me, also was just interesting because that's where the old division rival, we kind of know what they like to do in a big situation. I think that came into play. It was a very interesting aspect. Last thing, because I know we got to move on this game since we've talked about it for an hour now. <laughs> we never talked about Baker's interception, the pick six. Yeah, yeah. All there is to this, very simple. He just made a bad throw. It was a blitz to his right. They dropped the weak side linebacker. Bowser. Bowser, if he, th- he threw the ball five yards off target, if he throws the ball towards the boundary, he's going to have Higgins over there, and they're going to catch the ball. But the ball kind of came out of his hand funny on the side of his hand, yeah. and he, he threw it basically. At- Bowser didn't have to move. He hit Bowser in the arm without him even moving. It literally hit him right in the bicep. You're right. So um, that, that to me was that, and I think we hit everything possible uh, about the game. And Still- sorry I snapped before by saying that. You know, okay. <laughs> what? When you were like, I don't know what we do. And then, you know, he, Pete was talking, Dad was talking, and that's why oh, I was just, like, just, it's my <laughs> podcast. Let's start right here. Okay. I think sorry. that's good. All right. I think good. that's good. Good. To take control. Sometimes you got to yell at the old line, you know? You know what? Or, or, or your dad. Or your dad. Or your co host. <laughs> or your producer. <laughs> Any of the above. Okay. Chiefs, Dolphins. Chiefs win 33 27. Yeah. Uh, of course, we're going to start with Patrick Mahomes. Uh, let's take a look at what he has done. Uh, or I, I think we what he did against the Dolphins. There we go. Okay, so 24 out of 34, 393. Uh, the three interceptions highlighted there for a reason. Uh, he'd thrown only two the entire season coming in, so that was very unlike Mahomes. Right. Also in the stadium, threw two picks earlier this year in the Super Bowl on that same field, leading Mahomes after the game to say this. part i mean now we've won the super bowl super bowl here and uh we uh, we've just clinched the afc west and so it seems like every time we leave the stadium where we have a hat uh, of some type of thing we've accomplished um but in the hate part i, I feel like i have a half of my interceptions it seems like at this stadium he also has two wins and in two wins two trips there. and a super bowl mvp on one of them so it's hard to have too many bad thoughts there so and uh for mahomes we, we have a lot of good throws to talk about if yeah. we'd like to but we don't often have three interceptions. No, we to don't. discuss. No, and I mean, so you know, let's start there. Let's hit on it. You know, the all right. You know, the first one, they're driving like a machine. Yep. It's gonna throw the old fake to the left, fake to the right, middle screen to Kelsey. Right. Gets a little unlucky. You yes. know, Van Ginkle 
Okay, I, I think I'm saying that right. He falls down. Right. I totally think Mahomes sees it and knows it. But as he's kind of gearing up the throw, Ben Ginkle got up quickly. I thought he didn't know. I mean, I, I thought maybe just, or maybe he just saw him on the ground and thought, yeah. "I'm going to get it there." Right. Yeah. Either way, you know. But yeah, he kind of just thinks, "Okay, he's on the ground. I'm going to get it there." Ben Ginkle pops up in a hurry and gets his hand on it, pops it up, interception. Okay, it's football. It's not perfect. Things like that are going to happen. Right. Now, you know, then he has the next series is bad snap on first down. And then the third down, 30-yard sack that we've mm, talked about right. already a little. So there goes that series. Third series, moving like a machine again. Here we go. Oh, okay, here goes the Chiefs again. You know, nobody opened downfield, moves to his left, got Edwards Hilaire underneath, you know, makes a typical routine awkward throw that we see right. Mahomes make and throws it, I don't know, three, four feet too high, too right? High. Yep. I mean, Edwards Hilaire could not get a hand on the ball. Right. And interception. So, you know, Again, Miami, we know they're really good and all that, but I can't sit here and tell you anything like was special about what they did in those scenarios. I think that is one where I just chalk it up and go, he, he's, not, he's human. He missed, yeah, he missed exactly. a throw or two. First one was great effort, so right. kind of an unexpected effort from the ground right. from the Dolphins. Second one, more times than not, high school, college, NFL, if, if you throw a hard ball above the frame to a running back, it's going to get tipped. Right. I mean, that's the only one I thought was, was really on him. Yeah, I, I think so, too. I think that's the only – well, I'll say this. The third one's on him, too. Really? Definitely. I thought that was just all – It was a great play. Clap, clap the house. It yeah. was a great play. But I think if we went back and watched this, you know, you'd go – if he throws the ball 10 yards farther, Hill's going to catch it and not even have to be touched. He's going to score a touchdown. It's going to be easy, you know. So he threw a safe ball thinking – I'm going to not lead him out of bounds or do something like that. My guy will make a play. But Xavier Howard's phenomenal. He's got mm-hmm. the best ball skills maybe at any corner in football, as you see. The ball touches his hand, he intercepts it. But, yeah, that was another opportunity. I'm talking about this is Patrick Mahomes. Tyreek yeah. Hill had him beat by two steps. Yeah. You can't throw that throw. Okay. All right? He's, you know, every, everybody else I might give a little leeway to. I'm <laughs> not going to give it to Mahomes. I initially <laughs> would have answered this question that Pete has written down here on the three picks. Was it more bad Mahomes or good Dolphins D? I would have said – it was only one time, Bad Mahomes, but maybe you're, you're leaning me into saying I'm saying it's, more it's two, two, okay. two. But, you know, like, that last one, okay, you can, like, you know, again, you, you can live with that. Yeah. You know, you, like you said, it is a damn good player on the other side, too. But still, yeah. I mean, if, if you're the Dolphins and you were right there, yeah. I mean, at least the, the final score would, would suggest you were right there, the number is six with, with sacks and interceptions from Mahomes. Like, yeah. you don't get to six with those two combinations uh, very often against Kansas City. You no. got there. And you still lose. No, I, I know that. Well, that's that's the amazing thing about Kansas City. I mean, we're sitting here; they're twelve and one, and I don't think they've played an A or an A plus game this season. I mean, that's that's what's amazing, especially recently. Right. That's what's scary about them. It's just like it's scary because you're like, I mean, I don't know. They could keep doing this and just not look good at certain moments of the game, and they still win, or or they get it together and they just blow everybody out once they get to the playoffs and the Super Bowl. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked either way. I wouldn't be shocked if we saw a lot what, what we saw last year from Kansas City in the playoffs or them get it together and dominate everybody. I think it could go either way. I don't know. Are you at all concerned about the lack of domination? I realize that it's a tough question, but we're talking about a team that's 12-1. and one. Yeah. Five wins in a row by six points or less. Well, it, the, the, like, it should be more than that. You know, I, they've had – they dominate games and don't put teams away. And, again, this is another thing where it's the perfect example. You know, there was nothing that stopped the Kansas City Chiefs during this football game. Nothing. You know, at no point was Miami in the, like, the power position. Nothing like I've said, like, where the, they lost to the Raiders earlier this year, where I went, no, the Raiders figured it out. They started to control them. At no point during this game did I go, oh, Miami's figured it out. They got them. Right. It was a moving machine all game long. All right? And then, you know, it's 28 to 10. They're moving the machine down the field. He throws the screen pass to McCall Hardman. He fumbles. Mm-hmm. And then... The next drive, it's still 30 to 10. He throws the interception on a first and 10 to Tyree Kill down with the Xavier Howard. So, again, it's like, you know, a great Baltimore Ravens team in the early 2000s. We went, oh, the defense has got to put them away. This is the great offensive show of 2020 with the Kansas City Chiefs. They're built through the offense. Offense, got to put them away. Defense is not going to do that. So, that, was, that to me is on them uh, more than anything. But the game itself, too, just some of the schematical thoughts and all that, one thing I was really excited to see was, like, the thing we've talked about with Flores, these all-out blitz looks and all that, right? 
they were scared shitless to do any of that early in the game. Clearly. I mean, clearly, right? I mean, yeah. you watch it back. You don't ever see it until I believe about the third. I wrote it down. I can't remember exactly where it was, but maybe late second quarter, third quarter, finally is when they do it. And, you know, you might out there go, well, why? Why didn't they do that if it's worked against everybody else? Because this is a different animal. This guy's smart. He knows where to go to the ball when it's a, a quick blitz. He knows how to avoid blitzers. He'll fade away from blitzers and throw 60 yards down the field still. So, And then they can throw the McCall Hardman screen that he right. fumbled. That yeah. was an all-out blitz. Yeah. So that, those are the things that Brian Flores is like, hey, it's been great against everybody else, but it ain't going to work against this team. Yeah. They, they, even the old, we're going to show the all-out blitz and bail out, right? Yeah. You can't do that against this they group. We're doing it. Well, you can't yeah. because, you know, you bail out and, hey, we're going to try to, like, play bail out and play Tampa 2. Oh, Tyreek Hill's in the slot. The guy that's supposed to be the middle linebacker in Tampa 2, he was up at the line of scrimmage faking a blitz. Tyreek Hill's 50 yards by him, so you can't do it. So that's where Kansas City's, you know, brains and their talent on the field can scare right. you away from things you want to do. Wouldn't you rather, and even though it makes sense, right. that, that, that they would back off of that because of the respect they have for Mahomes and Reed and what they can do? Yep. Wouldn't you rather have them come out and say, we're going to do the same thing to you that we did against Jared Goff. We're coming after you. We're showing crazy looks. We're going to be aggressive. Even though it could burn them, wouldn't you rather have them do that? <sighs> or no? No. Or was that the right play? Not against this group. I would not. Because, and especially with me, with a young quarterback on the other side, I'd be too worried about if we come out over aggressive, it could backfire in my face and we could be down 35 nothing before we really get going here. So I think that's what you worry about, you know? And, and yeah, I just wouldn't blitz Mahomes. Yeah. I wouldn't. I, I've never seen anybody be seen be successful with it yet. The teams we've seen be good play coverage and do that. So the game started out with, we're going to play zone and do that. And even though the ball was turned over, I know Brian Flores had to look at it and go, I don't like the way this looks. He's getting completions easy. Right. And we don't have a great pass rush. So then... Once they started to have a little success, you know, they came out and they played some man-to-man. -man. They started to go, okay, we got to play some man-to-man. -man. Even though it had no points yet, they go, okay, it's still too easy the way it looks. They marched down the field. Right. And, yeah, Mahomes threw two interceptions, but it didn't look the way I'd like it to look. Then they play man-to-man -man a little bit. And, you know, Kansas City had some, some things ready for their man-to-man. -man. You know, whether it's the long touchdown pass to Tyree Kill and things mm -hmm. like that, where, you know, they're doubling Tyree Kill. And we, I think we can take a and look we got, at that. We got that we one on that here? One there, Pete. Yeah. The it's 44 it, yard touchdown. They had a lot of sprint outs in the game plan. Yeah. Well, this was, hey, you think we're going to do a sprint out quick throw, but this time we're going to trick you and sprint out and set up. You see Travis Kelsey stays in. They are doubling two different guys here. As you can see, if you rewind one more time for me, Nicole, you know, they are doubling Sammy Watkins and Tyreek Hill. 14 to the right is being doubled by the safety and 40. So go ahead, play it, you know, and you could see there. Now, the thing they're playing for, because teams have done this to the Kansas City Chiefs. All right, and let me just go back one more time to the start, and I'll tell you when to start one more time. They're playing for... You know, okay, McCole Harmon to the right runs an out route or a go route, and 14 and 10 are going to run the deep crossers and right. cross each other. Yep. That's one of their bread and butters. And this is what New England and the Raiders have done to take it away. So the two safeties are, they're doubling guys, expecting them to cross into their boundary, right? And Andy Reid's smart. He knows that. He's going, oh, they've seen this a lot. And, and the Patriots, Brian Flores came from there, have taken this aspect of my game away. So they'll see Mahomes run to the right, and usually the backside, the backside uh, receiver on a sprint out runs a crossing route anyways. So it's kind of a double whammy. They're expecting a crossing route regardless. Right. And he rolls out, and now you can play it, Nicole. And he makes it look like he's going to run the crossing route off the line of scrimmage and then goes vertical. And you can see that safety to the weak side. He kind of came down thinking, wait, i got to cut him off on the crossing route. Yeah. And he straightens it up. Yeah. And it's too late because once Tyreek Hill is even, he is leaving. Yeah, and even if he's not even, he's most likely leaving. He's making leaving. leaving. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm looking at the two safeties there, and they were lined up 13 to 14 yards off the ball. Yeah. Early in the game, the Miami safeties were like 18 yards off the ball, and they didn't really get back to that. And it jumped out to me that they were so deep. But maybe if they would have stayed with that look, 
a pass like that doesn't happen. I know. I, it, it is. You know, listen, it's tough. You can't stop everything with Kansas City. Right. They got everything on offense now. They really do. They've become an unstoppable machine. The only thing that stops Kansas City is Kansas City that I've seen in the last four or five weeks. And even when they kind of stop themselves with the turnovers, they're still in the 30s. That's right. I mean, they find a way still to just go, oh, my gosh, they, it doesn't matter. I mean, that's what it's just, again, it's just scary. To what? How many points could they score if they don't, you know, f*** up, right. you know, four series a game in the second half? Um, but you know, your deep, your deep safety thing. Hey, that there, there's no doubt. There's part of that. Yeah. There is, you know, it's just, you know, you do it too much. They're going to find how they want to attack that as well. And I yeah. think early on, that's what scared him is he went, wait, I'm playing deep and soft. We're not getting close to him. And he's just picking us apart. Oh, there's, you know, Sammy Watkins over the middle for a 30 yard gain. And those were all zone coverages. He got in the man to change it up. And then he got a little more aggressive as the game went on because they became desperate and he had to force the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, Kansas City, of course, messed it up a little bit to let them back in the fold. But as usual, they reaccelerated when they need to to put the game away. Maybe the, the best defense is to have an offense. You have confidence to come out and hit the mid-30s or maybe touch 40 as well. Miami doesn't have that right no, now. No, they don't. Let's get to Tua. Yeah. Uh, I can look at the numbers, Chris, and say he hit 300 yards for the first time in his career. I had some good stretches. Uh, I'd like to know kind of your overall impressions of Tua and his first 300-yard game. Best game of his career. From every – I don't give a shit about stats either. You know me. I don't right. give a damn. I don't care less. I want to see, you know, NFL player type throws. Things aren't perfect. What are you going to do? You know I'm big into that. Mm -hmm. This was the best game for Tua in my opinion. Was it perfect? No, it wasn't. There's still mistakes. But they got into a position where they didn't want to be in. And then they made it, that made them probably play a game that they probably don't want to play yet with Tua, which is like, hey, we got to drop back and throw it, and we got to kind of live on your left arm. But, you know, I think the, the biggest thing is tight throws. That's where, I, the, the, and, and when I mean that, when I say tight throws, it's two different ways. You know, tight throws into tight coverage, mm -hmm. where I went, there we go, Tua. I like it. Ooh, you know, you're high low in the corner. You got to throw a 20 yard out route between a safety and a corner. Throws it in there. Way to go, big guy. Hey, it's a crossing route. It's tight man to man coverage. You can't miss this throw. You know, if you miss him behind, it's going to be a pick. You know, you got to throw it perfect. Bam, hits the guy right in the chest. There were so many of those throws in this game. I think he made more NFL type throws for me in the first half of this game than he has in his, all his starts combined to this point. Right. So, I am, I was, that was very, very, you know, um, uplifting and cool to see. Encouraging is the word I was looking for. Exactly right. Jorge Pima on Twitter asks yeah. you, from what you saw from Tua, is it possible he can grow into quarterback to build your franchise around, or are the Dolphins headed for several more years of quarterback mediocrity? No, I, I, I think from everything I've seen so far, you can, there's, you can build on this. Like, again, I'm not saying, like, I'm a wowed by, a, like, a Justin Herbert or a Joe Burrow. Okay, I'm not. But all right, so what? That doesn't mean he can't be awesome and their offense can't be awesome. Mm -hmm. You know, the one thing he does is he does not make a lot of negative plays for the most part. Through his first pick. Right, through his first Six pick. Six starts, one pick. He does a pretty good job for the most part not taking sacks mm -hmm. and things like that. And then, yeah, there's a handful of plays where I go, okay, I wish I could, he could have that back. You know, and, and maybe this game isn't get to the 28 to 10 or 30 to 10 spot. Yeah. But he's learning on the fly, and the game got away from them. They're not built to play this way quite yet. Right. But either way, they came back and, like you said, made it a competitive. And really, those two drives, they give them 17 and then 24. That's as good as Tua. That's as good as I've seen. It's really, it was a great game by, by Tua. And with any of these quarterbacks that we've talked about in a positive way the last couple of years, you often bring up how the team around him helps him. They're averaging a league low in yards per carry. So it's not like he's getting a lot of assists in no. the ground game. I know the running backs are hurt, but he doesn't have some of the assets or uh, benefits some of the other quarterbacks do. Agreed. You're right. And then, you know, even like this game, they ran a few boots early. But after that, Kansas City went, wait, the run game's not that good, and we're going to stop these boots. And right. he went, ooh, I don't know. What's he going to do from there? All right, well, what's he going to do? He's going to carve you up from the pocket. You know, definitely. So, you know, they, they uh even with the drop back pass game, I thought it was a very smart game plan. You know, it fits them. It fits him with what he wants to do. And, 
you know, there are some moments here where if we're going to break it down real quick, like, hey, it's 7 nothing. The drive they're going to get the field goal on. Mm-hmm. He, he has a, a, a third and six throw that he throws up to Devontae Parker for one-on-one. It wasn't a look to throw to Devontae Parker. I understand if it's a man-to-man, he's running a corner route, and he's a big guy, you want to give him a one-on-one chance. But the guy was outside of him all the time. He had Grant underneath for a walk-in touchdown. Yeah. You know, and I'm only saying this because this is Kansas City, and you know, 10 nothing ain't good enough. You need right. 14 nothing, right. right? And I'm just trying to say, like, these are just little moments of the game that you know, they could have maybe taken back momentum and didn't, didn't quite get there because two is young and maybe not – you know, hitting on all cylinders. But you're uh, right, that they way. had those moments early on that the Chiefs were ending drives with sack, interception, exactly. interception. I mean, th- th- there was that little window to take advantage, and that window doesn't come along very often against that team. No, it, it, it does not. You know, and, and you know, just, just another example, you know, the, it's 28 to 10, okay? And it's, it's third down, it's a four-man rush, okay? And they're around, like, their own 40-yard line. It's a four-man rush. It's two-man. They have the perfect play call. Yeah. They had a little underneath pick to Max yeah. Hollins, and he ran out to the left and left the pocket. There was no right. reason to leave the pocket. But, hey, that's just another example where I go, hey, it's 28-10. You know, even the safety he takes, okay? Last thing, and we'll move on. The safety he takes, he gets off of his proper read. They ran the old go, crossing route, in cut. You look at the go real quick to see if it's, like, what you like. But really, the first read is the crosser. His eyes never went to him. He went from one to three. If he went to the right guy over the middle, he's not going to get a safety, and he's going to throw it wide open to Kaseki over the middle. Mm-hmm. So, again, awesome game. Yeah. We're just showing you, like, the little room or little errors you make against Kansas City. You just can't afford to make it against this group, or, or they'll kill you. Rod Marks asks, from what you saw in the game, can you identify the pieces or maybe one piece the Dolphins need to add in the offseason to be in the conversation with the Chiefs every year? I think it's um, maybe one more wide receiver to round out that group. Obviously, the running back, as yeah. you've mentioned. And then the one thing I wrote here, you know, at the end of all this and when we were on the other side, hey, this Dolphins D is really good, you know. But if they want to compete with the Chiefs and the big boys like that, they got to get a, one more – they have to get a legit pass rusher. Because if you want to play four and coverage and safeties back and do all that, yeah, that's cool. But you got to have something that's going to get after him a little. You can't just let him sit there all day. I don't care how many people you put into coverage. So, like we've seen, again, the 49ers gave them issues because they had two pass rushers, right? Yeah. The Chargers have given them issues because they have two pass rushers. So uh, that would be the next step, I would say, for Miami. Uh, thinking about the Chiefs here, big picture, Chris, at lockdown, cornerback asks, which teams, as of right now, do you honestly believe can knock off the Chiefs in a playoff or Super Bowl Nobody. Matchup? Nobody. Who's closest to, to even being considered? Probably New Orleans or Green Bay, honestly. Let's take a look at the, uh, at the odds here yeah. from, our, from our partners at Points Bet for the, for the Super Bowl odds as they stand right now. So you said Green New Bay. Orleans and Green Bay would be my two. Anybody from the AFC? Um... Right now, they're, I mean, nobody's even close. Buffalo is the next one. I thought you might say Buffalo. And I think Buffalo would be my next one. Yeah. It would, Buffalo's defense has turned the corner. They're good. I don't give a crap what they were early in the year. Just like we talked about Baltimore the last five weeks is one of the worst defenses of football. Yeah. That's what they are right now. I, I can't go, oh, no, but they're really in the middle of the league. So what? They're not what they were in the beginning of the year. I don't know. If Pete, you could look it up on the fly, but I would think Buffalo's defense the last five or six weeks is towards the top ten in football. I would think so. Has it been the last five or six? I know the last it's, couple. It's been like it's really been through their whole win streak. Even yeah. the Hale the Hail Murray game, right? That was good defensive performance. We talked about it. If he doesn't complete the Hail Mary, he mm-hmm. throws for 190 something yards. Right. But no, they did the Patriots, the Seahawks, the Cardinals, the Chargers, the 49ers, the Steelers. It's six games in a row where it's pretty damn good defense on that side of the ball. And we know that Allen is special and mm-hmm. can make plays there too. So I think I would pick them to be the AFC Buffalo, team. Yeah. But the NFC teams, I think, are the matchup the best. Because, one, they have quarterbacks and offense that can put up points and do that type of stuff, right? right. That's the one thing I do. The Packers' defense would concern me. Mm-hmm. It would. Um, but it's at least a little exotic, and they have two really awesome corners 
to where maybe they can get a stop by confusing or making a play every now and then. And you don't, Kansas City's not a great running team, so Green Bay's lack of a run defense doesn't get exposed there. To me, those are the two teams that I think of. But if you're making me pick, yeah. no, I'm taking Kansas City. All I took way. Kansas yeah. City all the way from the start of the year. I'm not stopping now. No coincidence that when you talked about the NFC teams you think would have the best shot against the Chiefs, you said Green Bay, New Orleans, and did not mention your New York Giants. No. Bringing us to the 26-7 uh, offensive debacle uh, against Arizona. Yep. So now three days later, plenty of blame to go around, everything you watch and see. And I've watched this game a couple times, too. Right. Um, if, if it has to start with one, with one person or one group, Daniel Jones, offensive line, Jason Garrett, oh. the head coach for playing him when he clearly was compromised, where does it start for you? I, I would probably start with that. With playing I think him? the head coach and playing him. Yeah. That's a tough one there. By the end there. of the game, it was just like this. this he couldn't this do anything at the end of the game. He had to get out. There's no doubt about that. You yeah. know, I think it was, that was very risky. You know, the game plan I felt like was a little conservative that way, too. Just because probably, too, they're, they're a little worried about him moving or doing, dropping and then having to scramble. So, hey, let's call a quick pass game. Yeah. You know, that's what they did a lot early on, I think, to, to protect him that way. It was the first game he didn't have a rushing attempt? No rushing attempt. And that, that's a sneaky, important thing for, a, for this game, team right? and yeah. his game and this offense that's not the greatest in the world. They need those two or three runs he has every game to help them in some big situations. But I guess I would look at it that way. You know, I'll say this too. You know, the all line of course, was not good. But it wasn't as horrible as I thought through the first three quarters, at least, as I thought on Sunday watching the game. What about the strip sack early? Well, the strips, that's a great way, spot, uh, spot to, to start there. I mean, that's how the game starts. Marcus Goldman, who was released by the Giants, or yeah, released by the Giants or traded to Arizona, either way, was there. But this is where, this is where, yeah, this is the, this photo, this is really interesting here. The Giants are a maul you team. They want to maul you up front. That's what they did to the Seattle Seahawks. And you see here, it's three tight ends in the game, right? Yeah. And, then, you know, they've, they've been running the ball pretty well. Now, the other thing here is Arizona has got four D linemen in and four linebackers in on this, on this play, right? Yep. So, now... An important part of an offense here because they're going to run a play action pass the New York Giants. Who's who? Who are the D linemen? Who are the linebackers? All right? So anybody watching on YouTube, you need to see this because we're showing an actual picture here if you're just listening to the podcast. But there's four D linemen and four linebackers. The guy standing up all the way up top over the left tackle, you know, on the, D, on the line of scrimmage, Paul. Yeah. It has to, he's the defense end over there. You have to start him as defense end. Right? Yes. So that's defense end. Now the next guy in is the shade nose to the weak side, right? You see him, right? Now to the right of him, or, you know, to, to, to the offense's right, you have another guy over the right guard as a three technique, right? You see him. And then there is one more guy on the outside edge of the offensive tackle. Okay? Now this is a great end. Now there's extra people in the game. All right? The other guy with his hand on the line of scrimmage there, and I believe it's 97, I can't tell, because he's actually got to be counted as the outside linebacker. Does that make sense to you? That's I'm going to stand up over, right now over the first, in and show the first you. two tight ends. This defense end, yep. defensive tackle, defensive tackle. All right, hold on. I need that picture so I can point, point at it again. I need that picture just so I can explain it. 43 is a defensive tackle. The next guy in on the shade nose. I mean, uh, sorry, 43 is a defense end. Next guy on the shade nose, defensive tackle. Three technique, defensive tackle. The guy over the offensive tackle is your defense end. That's four defense alignment. I don't give a damn what the other guy is. I know in theory he's a defense alignment, but for schematical purposes, we have to make him the outside linebacker. He's the Sam linebacker on the line of scrimmage. Don't worry about his number and the size of his ass. His ass is big. Yeah, he's a defense <laughs> alignment. But he has to be considered the outside linebacker. So those defense alignment, and now this big defense alignment who's the outside linebacker, the offensive line is going to pick them up. But now, because of this, we have 44 on the edge, Marcus Golden, right? Yeah. Marcus Golden, it's a 4-4 defense. It's four defense alignment, four linebackers. He has to become the strong safety. 
I know he's number 44 and he's a defensive end outside linebacker. But for this defensive alignment and for the rules of pass protection and the running back and the quarterback, that is the strong safety. That is the running back's guy to pick up. But I don't think anybody identified it because there's four big guys and four linebackers in the game, and they're confused. And people just see 44, he's an outside linebacker, oh, or defense end, well, the offensive line will pick him up. But no, it's a different defensive alignment. So that's very important to establish who is who in those kind of per- sets. You yeah. got a younger quarterback, you know, you got a backup running back in Gallman. You know, somebody there has got to be the adult or the, the guy here and go, hey, Gallman, I know it's 44, but that's actually a strong safety right now. Yeah. There's no other safety in the game. And this, th- th- just getting beat off the edge, I, I haven't they seen this all them. year. I haven't seen it all year where there are three tight ends to one side, three tight ends to the right of the right tackle, plus a running back. It, it's not an empty backfield. So no. the, the fact that you get beat off the edge with three tight ends to that side and a back, I mean, that's, that's something you'll see once a year. I, I Yes, but so one of those tight ends is running a passing pattern. Yeah. Now the other two, okay, one is going to worry about the guy we call the defense end, and then the other guy who's actually we're saying is an outside linebacker yeah. that we know is still a defensive lineman. So those two guys are going to be responsible for that. Secondary help and those and – and those – uh, secondary picking up the blitz help in those type of situations. One has to be in that type of set communicated to the offensive line that, wait, they're going to bring extra guys over there. So we all have to kind of fan out there. Yeah. Or you have to turn around and tell your running back, hey, that's the safety. I know it's a play action fake. Abort yes. the fake and go block him. Is that something that happens a lot? Definitely. Because, I mean, can the running back just have the green light to not do the play action? Yes, play? he has to, unless or your quarterback gets hit and right. they pick it up. But that's it. It's 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 a str- Sam s- strong safety blitz, but the Sam was a defense alignment. Yeah. And the strong safety was also a defense alignment. Okay. But just to deeper, this is what teams do sometimes to confuse you. This is why you can look at the Baltimore Ravens roster every now and then. And everybody's a defense alignment. And you're mm-hmm. like, wait, but he's an outside lineman. Because they want you to like look at their roster and mess up your pass protection rules and stuff. And you have to treat them as bodies, you know, not necessarily, oh, this guy is this guy. No, no, th- these are, you know, wh- what am I trying to say? In our language, I know who they are as a person. It's an outside linebacker, but yeah. in schematics, they have to change him to a strong safety or that. I hope I explained that. That's tough to do. At so. NFL fan Matt asks, yeah. most of Giants Nation is blaming Jason Garrett's offense. Why are the same receivers as last year getting significantly less separation? Um, well, I'm not blown away by the offense. I, I understand that. I do. Uh, I think everything is kind of an issue. Pass protection was an issue. I would like to see more pre snap movement and different play design from the offense, there's no doubt. I don't think Daniel Jones has been as good as last year either. You know, so I think all of those have kind of played into that aspect. You know, young offensive line, no Saquon Barkley and that, all that. I just think it's been a struggle for them altogether. But I won't disagree with what was said there. I would like to see a little bit more, you know, creativity and pre-snap movement sometimes just to help out the offense. And Give them that advantage that, like, my dad talked about, you know, mm-hmm. earlier. Daniel Jones couldn't move late in the game. He clearly wasn't comfortable running a little bit throughout the game. But strictly his reads and what he was seeing downfield, are there missed opportunities there? I, I, I can't say that there really was. You know, I think there's one play where uh, there was one play in the third quarter where maybe he, could, he threw a – it was a third and one. He threw a fade to the right sideline to uh, – Shepherds, a Sterling Shepherd, and it was clearly man to man, and they had a little pick play on the front set, side, and he's got the guy wide open. But no, I mean, plays like that are going to happen. They're pre snap. He just went, I'm going to go to the one on one matchup. I don't like my guy. I don't know if we'll definitely execute the pick on the other side. But I did not look at it like, oh, he missed players or missed receivers. Hey, they got their butts whooped. Mm-hmm. That's, that's all, all there is to say. You know, they couldn't find a way to run the ball. Arizona was had no fear of the Giants wide receivers other than Slayton. It was the only guy they worried about. They got in their face with Darius Slayton in a few plays. They doubled them or shaded the safety over there because they were worried about him. 
So, you know, there's nothing there. What I mean, Golden Tate and Sterling Shepard are not striking fear into secondary or defensive coordinators to go, oh, we can't play them man-to-man. So that hampers things as well. And then when they can't run the football, that's an issue too. You know, the Giants are one of those teams that have to play a certain way. And if they play that certain way, they can beat just about anybody. But if it even ventures off of that, they're in deep crap. And we saw that it ventured off very quickly there in this one. Standing say they're only one game behind the Washington football team in the NFC East. Just listening to you, it feels like they're, they're further than one game back. Well, yeah, it's just, it, it's, it's, you know, I don't want to mislead or say anything that way. You know, I still think the defense is damn good. But, you know, the offense, if they can't control the clock and run the ball and do that, I don't know if there's enough there for them to be successful on that side of the ball. So they need to do that. That makes everything easier. And, you know, the Arizona just, so that's set there, the four down linemen, yeah. you know, with four linebackers. They were going all out on the run. You weren't going to, they were not going to let the run game get off on them like it did against the Seattle Seahawks. They said, no, we'll have, we got to see you beat us with the pass game. And we got pretty good cover corners we feel comfortable about. And their speed and movement up front just caused chaos for the Giants to where they couldn't, you know, sort it all out all the time and it let people, you know, run free and, and make tackles for losses in the run game. Elsewhere in the NFC, and let's, let's turn our attention, Chris, to an offense that, that had some success on Sunday. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they'd lost three out of four. They had a bye week. Exhale a little bit. They come back with a solid win over the Vikings, 26-14. I know you have thoughts on the offense. They ran and what Brady did. Yeah. Let's start it, though, with Bruce Arians saying this after the game. We do not well, have we it. Do not we have did it. say <laughs> we can do any damn thing we want oh, to Oh, that one, that quote, which I've, I've seen already. And, you know, I, I don't know if I totally agree with that, but I would say, like, they did if they're going to do what they did the other day against Minnesota, yeah. they're going to be really damn tough to beat. Your yeah. notes were really positive. I could tell as you were watching it, you liked what you saw. So what would you like best? It's one of the best games of the year for them on the offensive side of the ball. I don't give a damn. I don't give a damn about the 26-14 either. You know, early on, it was still good. Brady just messed up some third and shorts early on that, you know, got them off the field and Minnesota was driving the ball. But, man, I, I never really looked at it all day to where I went, oh, Minnesota's got, you know, they're all over Tampa or they're physically dominating them or, you know, Zimmer's on their scheme or anything like that. Paul, you've heard me say this. You know, I don't know what the numbers are. But I've been begging for this for like week four. They are at their best when they play two and three tight end sets. Antonio Brown played at the least he has played so far in his career in Tampa. Because they went to the bye week, and I'm hopefully they self-scouted themselves yeah. and said, wait, what are we doing? Brady's better when we play two tight end sets. Our run game is better because of that. And we get more explosive plays. I love that Brady went 15 completions for 196 yards. It's getting a lot out of your completions. Exactly. Yeah. You're changing field position. You're explosive plays. Those are scary offenses. Right. Sc scary offenses are not the offenses that go 35 for 50 for 304 yards. That's not scary. That's just boring and like quarterback statistic hornness. I don't know what it's, it to say. It's so true. And, you, and I know that stats can be misleading. And I, I, I kind of read into them more than you do. But yeah. Kirk Cousins was under 10 yards per, per completion on Sunday, and it looked that way. Right. There are a handful of quarterbacks every week, and you go back after watching the game, you're like, that pass game never scared me. Yeah. Well, he was averaging like seven yards per completion. Right. Anytime you get a quarterback like Brady Sunday over 10, you know when you're watching, you're like, these guys are pushing it downfield. Right. Yeah, I felt that when I was watching. They it were, that way. They were attacking. They were going to stress the defense. They weren't going to play the dink and dunk game and do all of that. Okay, yeah. You know, with this style of play, too, it kept them in third and manageable a lot, too, to where now, oh, it's shotgun and it's third and four or third and five. Brady is going to make the right decision here, and he's going to carve you up. Bam. A perfect deep throw for that touchdown, wasn't well, it? Perfect deep throw for the touchdown. You know, and, you know, I just want to get to this in my notes here just to make sure I got this right. But, you know, that was another one where it's, it's play action, you know, wide open and he's comfortable because he knows he's protected they've kept a tight end in the block mm -hmm. so because of that it was a beautiful throw and you know here's the other thing um it's a third down oh wait i'm i'm wrong here i'm wrong okay the post route for the td you know why he was comfortable on that one 
because it was a three-man rush. So he knew, okay, I, can, I don't have to worry. Brady under pressure is still a little bit of a concern for me, but I think he'll be under less pressure if they play this way with the two tight end sets. Yep. You know, one, running the football, that's going to scare teams from blitzing too much. Oh, wait, we don't want to blitz because they'll keep six and seven guys in the block, and then we're, we're going to be compromised downfield. You know, that's what running the football will do for you. And I think it was just, I think it was some of the best play Brady had all year, and it's the best the offense looked. And Ronald Jones has a kind of afternoon 18 for 80. That's not awesome. But if you're playing with two or three tight ends and your running back is having little chunks of success like that, yes. makes your quarterback more comfortable the entire day. Well, definitely. I mean, you know, 18 for 80, LaShawn McCoy, four for 32. I would take. 22 rushes for 122 right. yards, and he get, it's the same thing as the run game I and mean, the pass game we just talked about. Now, yeah. now you're going. Wait, every time they drop back to throw, it's a 15 yard completion, and every time they run the ball, it's an eight yard completion. And the beauty of it, it had a nice flow within the offense. Because here's the other thing: when you're a Big 12 team and all that too, you know what they did. I thought was really cool when they got an 11 personnel with three receivers. They still got in some run sets where Gronk is on the right. He's off the ball just a little bit. And then they got Chris Godwin down there real close on the ball. Godwin's a great blocking wide receiver. So now some of those two tight end things you like to do in the running game, you can still do them in those sets with a pretty good wide. Now it might not be as powerful and everything like I'm saying, but still now the defense is like you can't pin the defense. The defense can't pin the offense into going, oh, it's, it's 11 personnel. They're going to throw it. And it, or if they run it, it'll be a running back draw, something like that. No, they'll pull, still play smash mouth in those sets. And they did that a few times, too, where, you know, they block down and they ask Chris Godwin, hey, get the strong safety who's down in the box and block him down, and we'll pull the guard around and do that. Uh, I just thought from everything that way, if they can play that style of football, they're going to be tough to beat. One of the connecting themes here in this show today, you talked about Cleveland, two and three tight ends running a lot, how it's made Baker that much better this year. Now, the Buccaneers with what you like uh, for their game plan more than you have in the last few weeks. I mean, doing the same kind of things. I mean, who else Who else out there is getting a lot done with two and three tight ends, running first, getting the quarterback under center? Yeah, okay. I mean, well, first off, Green Bay Packers, yep. good amount, right? Now, they do it really well. Yeah, they do it really well. They kind of play it through the pass first, right? They're a little bit like pass first, but they're going to get on the center and stress you with the run and the, and the, the boots and the play the Tennessee Titans. So there we have the number two offense in football and the number three offense in football, who run is very important to them. Then the Rams are the number five offense in football. I mean, mm -hmm. all we ever talk about is if they can't run, can they, right. can they move the ball? All right, so you got them. The number seven offense in football is the Minnesota Vikings running the ball, yep. fullback, tight end, play action pass. Okay, so and then, you know, the Cleveland Browns at 11. And the New Orleans Saints at 13, and the Raiders at 14. I'm telling you, this is the new NFL. The spread is going to go be a part of it, but the NFL defensive world has caught on to the spread. They've caught on to the spread. As I said last year, what the NFL defensive players are not used to is, whoa, fullback's running at me. Whoa, pulling guard is running at me too. That is that these, these young players have not seen in their high school and college careers anymore. And I really think that's where the NFL is going to go back that way. The, the success leaving, uh, leaving crumbs there along the way. All these teams doing it well, consistently yeah. doing it well. Uh, a lot of them playing that way. They are. Pete, uh, I know we didn't have the sound earlier. Do we have the Scotty Miller 48-yard touchdown? I want to get back to that. It was Okay, we, we don't have that one either. So, uh, But it was, it, was, it was, you know, to me, the reason I wrote that, and that was so important, because on that, on that drive um, – they had a big play action pass. That's what confused me. But the big thing is, and that's why I'm big on the two tight end thing. You know, Brady is when he's, it's all about his comfort and comfort in the pocket. If he's comfortable in the pocket, his arm is awesome. He can throw it anywhere, any way, any style he wants. It's awesome. It's all about, does he feel comfortable and will he be willing to stand in there and do that? You know, and that's where I like, you know, there, there, there was the, um, the first two third downs. He had a little pressure around him. Gronk yeah. was wide open on the first third down of the game. He missed him because people are around him. You know, the second third down of the game, 
uh, where they go three and out. There's people around them again. I mean, Miller and Godwin are wide open for touchdowns. I mean, touchdowns. It's like throw to either one, and they're not going to get touched, and they're going to score. But there's people around them, and he just not doesn't see as clearly. So that, to me, is the big reason. It's the best for their football team. Mm-hmm. It's the best for him. And, of course, that's going to correlate to winning football games. Even on that that, po- uh, that perfect post route, he threw to Miller for the touchdown. Yeah. You mentioned they only rushed three. Right. He had an instant there where he thought about really flinching and looking down he, and kind of being uncomfortable. He, he did his old, like, wait, are they around yes. me? And then he looked up, you know, he saw around me. He went, wait, they're not. Okay, let me relax again and I can throw it. Right. So it's normal. I mean, I'm, I would be like that right now and I'm not 43. So, I, I, you know, <laughs> I'd have been like that if I was 33. I mean, so I, I get that. Right. You got to feel comfortable and especially when you're that age and all the hits he's taken through his career. Uh, bottom line, Bucks looking pretty good after that win. Eight and five in very good position yep. to, to make the playoffs. Okay, are you ready for the uh, tight end version? I'm doing it. First Let's time, do it. quarterback jeopardy Let's do driven it. by the tight ends. And uh, this, is, this really started, uh, Pete sent me an email. Uh, I think it was a text actually talking about Travis Kelsey on track to becoming the first tight end ever to lead the NFL in receiving yards. He's on top right now. Before we get to that, I want to put him in your uh, self-scouting thyself club because I was reading one of his quotes after the game about their uh, penalties and their interceptions. He said, we're self-inflicting ourselves. It's catching on. I mean, he's automatically got to be one of your guys. Oh, he, well, he is. I mean, I, I love being around him, first off. I've been around him Funny a few dude, times. Right? He's a great dude. <laughs> he is. And uh, this is a, we've, we've had a few self <laughs> self things go on in the NFL lately. Florio's giving me some credit. He's like, I think people are listening to you because uh, we've had a few coaches lately like, self-scout thyself and stuff like that. He, he hasn't ac- accidentally given you one, though, has he? No. Like, no. No, he has not. Okay. No. Okay, so inspired by Travis Kelsey trying to become the first tight end to lead the NFL in receiving yards. Yep. For 100. Leads the NFL with 1,250 yards. Who is second among tight ends, sitting at 22nd overall with just over 800 yards? Oh, I'm going to say Darren Waller. You win. Okay, good. I wasn't sure, but I, I just figured. Thank you. I felt a little bit. I thought that was pretty tough for, for 100. It was a, good, it was a tough, okay. tough lead off, but it's all right. You're off and running. This one is more difficult for 200. Travis Kelsey, the fifth tight end selected in 2013. Chiefs got him in the third round. Name any of the four taken before him. Three are still playing. Gosh, that is going to kill me there. I am not going to get that. But hold on, hold on, hold on. All right. Take your time. Yep. 2014, did you say? 2013. 13. Yeah. Damn, so Pete's wait. worried about I was going to say, I know, he should concerned. be worried about it. Yeah, I was going to say Ebron, but Ebron was the next draft, so that's not that. Hold on a second. Just okay. give me a second here. Yep. Who else am I missing? Two. 2013. Matt Casey got one? Go. Oh, I am <laughs> choking. Um, Do you know Matt? <laughs> He's not listening to me. So the, the question is, Travis Kelsey, the fifth tight end taken in 2013. Name any of the four taken before him. Three are still playing. Kyle Rudolph. You're close. You're, you're at the right school. Is it Eifert? Eifert is one Damn of them. Damn it. Yeah. I, just, I wasn't sure which year was which. Yeah, Rudolph's so, too old for that, right? So, I think, yeah, so. he's not on here. Eifert was first. Yeah. Zach Ertz. Oh, Ertz was. Yeah, Damn it. Ertz, yeah. Ertz was the first thing that went to my mind. I just wasn't sure if that was that class either. Damn mm-hmm. it. It's yeah. been a while since I looked at my tight end classes. R- Rudolph was 11. Gavin Escobar from San Diego State was in this oh, group. Oh, man. The Cowboys, right? Yep, I remember Vance him. McDonald went ahead. Oh, Vance, Vance was too. Okay. Rice had two tight ends selected that year, which was, was strange. Okay. Damn it. These are usually in your wheelhouse, your draft class. Yeah. For 300, your draft class of 2003, one tight end went in the first round. Oh, shit. This is the worst. <laughs> one, only one. Um, hint, there's, you know, there's, there's a reason I chose to, to bring this one up. Oh, he's an Iowa guy. I didn't, I, you know, I, just, I didn't say that specifically, but you can draw that conclusion if you'd like to. Gosh. I, you know what's crazy? Is Dallas Clark? Yes. It is him. Yeah. I, yeah. I had honestly forgotten that Dallas Clark was in my draft class. Really? I really did. Yeah. I don't know. It's a long time ago. I've been hitting the head a few times, and that's what happens. <laughs> so Dallas was a, was a walk-on at Iowa. Wow. And, uh, Brett Bielma, who's now coaching with the linebackers, sure. uh, one of my buddies from way back when, I remember having a dinner with him. He's like, we got this guy. He's great on special teams. Don't know what to do with him. Don't know if we should scholarship him. 
Don't know what side of the ball to play him on. Right. I think they tried him at linebacker for oh a while. So Dallas Clark. Yeah, Dallas yeah, Clark. Fit in perfectly what the Colts were doing. Oh right my gosh, way. amazing. I know. So that's two out of three. Yeah. Okay. Kind of. You kind of gave me a nice hint there. You were nice. It was, yeah, that's, it that, was nice. that was an assist for sure. Yeah. 400. Tony Gonzalez, the most recent tight end to go in the Hall of Fame. Right. Played a dozen years with the Chiefs, but 17 years overall. What quarterback threw him his most touchdown receptions? Ooh. All right, so he's got some good ones here. Feel free to brainstorm out Yeah, loud. I mean, you know, I, I, the Matt Ryan thing is, is, you know, a good little run there. But, you know, um, gosh, Trent Green would, uh, is the guy I'm leaning towards. Hold on, not final answer yet. I just got to think about that. Don't give me those fake looks either. I think that was a <laughs> fake That was a fake look. <sighs> I'm going to go with Trent Green. Mm, I'm that, wrong. Yeah, Matt Ryan. Yeah. It was Matt yeah. Ryan. I also would have guessed Trent, because he played with Trent longer. I know, but those years of Matt Ryan, they... Yeah, yeah. it was close. 35 from Matt, 34 from Trent Green. God, You're right there. Damn. You're right there. Okay. I, yep, the amount of years is the only thing that saved me away. I knew he had put up some decent numbers there Yeah. Uh, with Matt Ryan. I just didn't think he played quite enough years there. But I would have felt pretty good confident one. in the Trent Green, because they, they were scoring a bunch they of points were. back then. I mean... Priest Holmes running the ball. Right. They were amazing. Yeah. Who would they have out wide? Um... Dante Hall returned. And, and I was also Eddie Kennison. Was Dwayne Bow? No, Dwayne Bow was not there. Dwayne no, Bow was a little. He was later. a little later. A little bit later. Yeah, who are we call. missing at receiver? They had the great punt returner who Dante, Dante Hall, Hall, right? Yeah, yeah he was. But awesome. we are missing another receiver. I can't think of who it is. Okay. All right, here we go. Five hundred. Big Phil went twenty-two out of twenty-five at the Giants Super Bowl. Twenty-one win. I can't over believe you're Denver. asking me anything about my dad. You know I'm going to get this. You also miss one in your draft class, though, so anything's <laughs> possible. So, which tight end caught the first oh. of his three touchdown passes? Come on. Are you kidding me with that I'm, question? I'm not kidding. That should have been a 100 question. Of course it's Zeke Moet. Oh, I thought you were going to You're go not going to get me with that. I can almost tell you the pull game play-by-play play in my you, mind you right like now. Four, how old were you? I was six and a half. You were six and a half. I was six and a half. Where, where were you sitting? I was sitting... You know, my dad was the quarterback of the Giants, so I was sitting right around 50-yard line, about, yeah. I'm going to say 40, 45 rows up, somewhere in there. Yeah. Yes. So it was good seats. Disney at halftime, Mickey Mouse, come on, Pretty six awesome. and a half? Yeah. What the f***? That's as good as it gets. Dad's, your dad's the MVP of the game, Disney at halftime. Yeah, well, yeah. The, yeah, I mean, we were nervous at halftime, though. I can tell you that. You know, it was 10 to 9 at the half. The Broncos had played the Giants. And it's John Elway. And I could see the fear in my mom's face. And I remember feeling nervous myself because she was nervous. Well, they were up early, too. They were 10 7. Yeah, yeah, it was 10 7. Went in the half 10 9 yeah. Broncos, and they missed a chippy field goal to go into the half. The, uh, the Broncos did. Barefoot guy, Rich Carlos. Yeah, Rich Carlos, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. 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 So that was, but then the Safety. second half. It Safety was, before half or right Safety after before half. half. Yeah. George Martin, yeah. Got him. Yeah. Yeah, and they, they dominated the second half. Dominated the second half, and he did. He hit Mark Bavaro twice, once over the Dropped. middle right in his yeah. belly, and then the other one that went up in the air and McConkie yes. caught, yeah. which people are still I – I had, I had a friend, like, oh, your dad got a little lucky on that third one. Lucky? He hit him in the face. <laughs> it's, He's got to f***ing pick his hands up. What? I mean, he hit him in the bullseye. Like, right. Yeah, McConkie's so. one who got lucky. McConkie got lucky, and he was dying he was to have his to NFL do. touchdown in the Super Bowl, and he got it right yeah. there. As many touchdowns as incompletions for Big Phil in that game. Yep. I was going to feel bad the entire evening about tricking you into saying Mark Bavaro, but no, you knew you, it too well. You're not going to okay. trick me with You got three out of five. <laughs> Johnny Morton. Oh, Thank Johnny you. Morton yeah. was there. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Derek, Derek Alexander, Alexander was it as well. From yeah, Michigan. okay, so pretty good group there. Yeah. All right. All right, three out of five. That's we good. did it. Yeah, it's kind of like two and a half out of five. You gave me the Dallas Clark hint. I don't think I would have came up with it. Yeah. Yeah. But that first you question was ridiculously anyway. hard. Okay, so. The uh, Darren Waller one? <laughs> uh, oh, it was the second one. The second one, yeah. That yeah. was hard. Pete, All right. Pete had no confidence in you whatsoever. Yeah, screw Pete. All right, the hell so with that him. Was, uh, that was that was long and, and all over the place. Big Phil came in. Man, oh, man. We were... I think we broke lot, the record today. A lot of range. Right. <laughs> if they're worrying about chopping this up for, like, Peacock streaming, they're going to have plenty like of somebody, material. Somebody's got their... Uh, their plenty of material. All right, let's get the hell out of here. Yeah. We're done. we got a snowstorm coming. Peace out. Hope everybody enjoyed the What the F*** Happened podcast edition. Chris Sims Unbuttoned, brought to you by Verizon. Thanks for tuning in. Keep sending your questions. I love answering them. 
they help with the flow of these breakdowns nice, and everything that way. Yeah. Um, I appreciate that. Thursday, PFTPM, Chris Sims Unbuttoned, the Joint Picks collaboration. We'll be doing that. I'll be doing it from home tomorrow. I'm hoping I'm going to be eating like some bacon and pancakes in the middle of that Sounds podcast. Nice. All right. Just yeah. going to have full service. You know, have the wife come in, give me coffee, do it all that way. I think I might do that tomorrow. This is two out of three podcasts. You, you, you refer to her as the wife. The wife. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a special. I'm using it as a special thing. Yeah, I, I'm not trying to demean in any way. Trust me, I would not be able to be me without right? the wife. Okay. It's true. She saved my ass in all, all facets of life. Yeah. Everybody be good out there. And remember, happy wife, happy life. So true. All right. We'll see you. Peace out. Have a good week. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.